Good evening, everyone. I'm Kate Ford, President of the Board, and we have concluded closed session this evening. It is Tuesday, November 16th, 2021, at 5.35 p.m. I'm calling to order this regular meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School District School Board. And now for information about interpretation for this meeting. Thank you, Board President Ford. Good evening. I will give this announcement regarding language interpretation in English and Spanish. Buenas tardes. Voy a dar este anuncio sobre la interpretación en inglés y en español. In order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous bidirectional interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you do not have to click anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you are using a laptop or a desktop, at the bottom right of your screen, you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. Please click on the globe now and select English. If you are using an iPad or a phone, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation, then select English and click done. And when it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear and speak at a moderate pace. Thank you. And we are also offering American Sign Language ASL interpretation for this meeting. If you will be using ASL interpretation, please use the Zoom app on your computer, tablet, or phone to join this meeting. If you joined this meeting through your web browser, you may not be able to see the ASL interpreter at all times. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea bidireccional en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, verá un icono en la parte inferior de su pantalla a la derecha en forma de globo que dice interpretación. Haga clic ahí ahora y seleccione español. Si está usando un iPad o su teléfono, localice el menú de tres puntos, haga clic en interpretación de idiomas, elija español y finalizar o finalizando. O si está en inglés, dice done. Y cuando sea su turno de hablar, por favor recuerde hablar con voz fuerte y clara y a un paso moderado. Gracias. Are there any questions with regards to interpretation? If there are no questions, we may begin. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Dr. Maldonado, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Please stand, face the flag. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, first of all, no action was taken or voted on in closed session tonight. And also tonight, the school board is again meeting in person, wearing masks as mandated by the Santa Barbara County Public Health and the Department, and the public may participate through live streaming. I want to remind the public again that as a result of Assembly Bill 361, we have new guidelines regarding public comment while conducting board meetings on Zoom. Members of the public wishing to speak must raise their hands in the Zoom webinar platform by selecting the virtual hand icon during the presentation of that item and may do so at any time while public comment remains open for that item. When persons are called on to speak, their microphone will be activated by district staff and the speaker will be notified that they can now unmute themselves in order to begin speaking. The speaker then needs to unmute themselves by selecting the mute unmute icon and state your name at the beginning of your comment. Also, if you're joining by phone, you just raise your hand by dialing star nine. Um, when persons are called on to speak, their microphone is activated by district staff and the speaker will be notified that they can now unmute themselves in order to begin speaking. The speaker will then need to unmute themselves by dialing star six and state your name at the beginning of your comment. That's if you're on the phone. Public comments tonight are limited to 90 seconds each. The COVID report number 31 is at its regular time of 6 p.m. tonight, and the board will take a 10 minute break after about two hours of meeting. And at approximately 7 p.m., we will have our third public hearing to, re to review the revised and additional conceptual trustee maps dividing the school district into five or into seven areas. The public and the board will have an opportunity to reflect on these maps again. So now, Dr. Maldonado, will you continue?
continue with your report to the board. Thank you, and I'll ask my staff to please upload our slides. Good afternoon, board members, stu staff, members of the public, some parents uh, with us, and, some, and students as well. Welcome. I want to start off by um, reminding uh, the board and some of the public on some of the things that I've talked about when it comes to how we want to think about school improvement. If we can go to the next slide. As an elementary teacher, I think of them as the ABCs. A's, of course, standing for academics, athletics, and the arts, which you'll hear a lot more about today. Belonging, which is something I feel important for many of our students. And of course, connectedness. Tonight, I'm gonna go over some of the work we're doing in these areas. Next slide. In our later report this evening, you'll hear from our education and student services team a progress report on the academics of our students. Due to the pandemic, we haven't had a progress report in quite some time, and this will be the first of a few progress reports we'll be bringing to you throughout the school year. There are some limitations to us doing this work right now, but we are looking to, do, uh, to glean some insights from some of the assessments that we have been giving our students to help us check in on their progress and also to make predictions on where they are headed. This will help us course correct and put in place interventions that are needed. This type of what I call progress report or check-in is really foundational to our multi-tiered systems of support work. Multi-tiered systems of support is all about regularly looking at data to determine where inter interventions and supports are needed. And it's something that you do at a district level as a, as a point of intervention, but it's also done at a school level as a point of transformation. Sometimes we have technical assistance from the state and also all of it is done in the hopes of improving outcomes for students. So you'll hear more about that today. And that's the area of academics. Now let's go into athletics. Next slide. Um, this week we saw the first days of college early signing period, which includes most sports except football. We had quite a few of our high school student athletes sign commitments to play collegial level sports after graduation. There will be more of these announcements to come. You can see on the screen here some of the names from each of the high schools. But I wanted to start by sharing some of these tonight with you. And congratulations to all those students who participated in signing day events at one of their campuses. Now the arts. Our high schools rounded out their theater season this year with some fabulous in-person productions. I know we had a great turnout to these events and that our students and theater teachers put a lot of work, incredible performances, creating inc incredible theater um, sets from Carry the Musical at Santa Barbara High, Clue at San Marcos, and Love and Information at Dos Pueblos. And we have a treat for you in a few minutes uh, that we've brought to this meeting. Next. Under our ABCs, we know that belonging is something that many of us crave, whether we are five years old or 55 years old. Um, and in school systems, this looks like having schools that are safe in climates and culture that are inclusive. Last meeting, you challenged us to really think about reimagining, reallocating funds, creating better alternatives at all three high schools. And so I wanted to just bring you a, a short um, update on some of the work I've been doing around community engagement with different stakeholders that you can see here. We held meetings at all the three high schools, but we do want to, and uh, two of the board members have been working with me, uh, board member Sims Moten and board member Munoz. We want to bring you a full report at our next board meeting, and I'm, I'm sure they'll make some comments on this later. But this idea of belonging in schools is super important, and I wanted to highlight that for you tonight. Superintendent Maldonado, it's actually Ms. Alvarez as opposed to Ms. Munoz. Sorry, I, yes, I was looking at Rose when I said that. Thank you so much for that clarification. <laughs> board member since one and board member Alvarez who will be here shortly. Thank you for that. Um, next slide. Um, in, in our last Inside Santa Barbara video, I wanna, I wanna make sure that you have had a chance to and members of the public who may be watching this meeting tonight we know that sometimes we make choices that lead us to, to things that can hurt us, especially when we don't feel a sense of belonging and connectedness. And there's an important message that Dr. Wagenick has brought to us uh, around a disturbing national and local trend related to the dangerous and potentially lethal drug fentanyl. If you've not, this, if you've not seen this video, please head to our website to learn more about this dangerous trend. 
And parents, guardians, and other trusted adults and community members who have concerns, please, please reach out to your child's counselor or school site for additional support. Lastly, um, or almost lastly, uh, under connectedness, in addition to creating safe and inclusive school climates, we've been working on ensuring that our students experience choices in the programs that we offer. Coming soon, you'll see that we are having our um, annual showcase event, which will take place this year on December 6th. The showcase will be virtual, and we're excited to have expanded on the content and offerings from last year to include our visual and performing arts programs. And during the month of December 6th, all 7th and 8th grade students will also explore the virtual showcase website with their teachers. At 6 p.m. on December 6th, we will also host a webinar for our parents and community members to kick off our open house season. For parents and students, if you want to learn more about a specific school or the pathways and programs at a specific school, you can also attend their upcoming open house events. All of these dates and times are listed on our website as well as each school's website. All three high schools will have open house sessions beginning at 6 p.m. Um, high schools are also offering tours and our junior high schools will be having uh, virtual open houses. All details again are in our uh, websites. The enrollment and transfer window is also now open. If students are interested in a pathway, academy, or program of choice that is not available at their zoned homeschool, they must submit an intra-district transfer request application for the 22-23 school year. The deadline is January 14th. Now it's time for celebrations. In a time where we're all um, feeling the effects of the pandemic, I'm so happy to bring to you a few members of our SB Unified community who deserve a shout out. The Santa Barbara South Coast Chamber of Commerce recently announced the 2021 Golita's First Finest Award winners. Golita's Finest is a 71-year-old tradition honoring remarkable individuals whose contributions have enhanced the Golita community. This year, our very own Dos Pueblos High Principal, Bill Woodard, was selected as the Educator of the Year. In giving the award, the Chamber Selection Committee com commended Principal Woodard for his tenacity and optimism and commitment to making things as best as they could be for students when the pandemic created so many curveballs. I can't think of a better leader in a high school to do that. They wrote, from shutdowns and remote learning to coming back to campus with masks and temperature checks, Woodard has kept a positive attitude and persistent communication. He provided a steady and unwavering voice of support at the toughest of times. And he is with us here tonight. Congratulations, Principal Woodard. Please tell us the secret to your success and congratulations. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Dr. Maldonado and board president Ford and the board and everybody, thank you for having me. It's good to see you all virtually. Um, my secret to my success is my team. And I kind of feel like with this recognition, which I truly am thankful for from the South Coast Chamber of Commerce, that it is like the producer of a Oscar winning movie, accepting the award on behalf of a team of people that uh, have done everything they can to support our families and our community during the last two years and into this year um, with a with a can-do spirit, uh, always asking what can we do, not what can't we do, uh, and always keeping our students at the center of uh, our, our work. So I'm very honored to lead this team and to represent uh, the school way out in Goleta that is still part of the Santa Barbara Unified School District. And we are grateful for all the support and encouragement from, from you all and the future is bright for SB Unified and for our school. So thank you very much. Thank you, Principal Woodard, and we love having those Pueblos in our school district. You make us very proud. Next, we have a student, Iman, uh, who's also joining us via Zoom. Congratulations to Iman, 14 years old, a Dos Pueblos ninth grader who won the first place mathematic awards in Broadcom Masters, the nation's premier middle school STEM competition for his project analyzing speech. The first pl place prize includes $3,500. His study was focused on how lengthening consonants in similar sounding words affects the listener's understanding of the words. Iman was featured on KEYT, but I also wanted to bring him here tonight to tell us a little bit about his study and the award. Thank you so much for being here. Tell us a little bit about your study and what it feels like to win first place. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, thank you for having me here. 
It's been an honor to be here, and I want to thank my principal, Mr. Woodard, for supporting me, as well as my science fair mentor, Mr. Bencala, as well. Uh, so it was truly an honor to be a Broadcom Masters, and I'm really grateful that the school is able to provide an opportunity to advance to eventually from the Santa Barbara County Science and Engineering Fair to the California State Engineering Fair, uh, to eventually advancing to the Broadcom Masters competition. It was really enjoyable to be able to compete at such um, at a level in STEM and um, to be able to partake in all of the team building challenges, um, critical thinking challenges, as well as all of the engaging activities and project judging that um, I was able to uh, do in the um, competition. So it was really an honor and I'm very grateful that we have been able to provide this opportunity. Congratulations, and again, thank you for making us proud and representing Santa Barbara Unified so well. And may you have much continued success. Thank you. Next, um, board members this week, our elementary schools are in the midst of parent-teacher conferences. They are taking place via Zoom this year. If we can go to our next slide, thank you. Which is something we have noticed that parents actually appreciate because it is so convenient for their schedules and other commitments like childcare. So far, attendance has been good, and I know that teachers are also going over their new report cards, which have been in the works since the beginning of 2018, finalized and worked on in 2019, and finally here we are in 2021, putting them in place. I want to thank all the teachers and leaders at the district office who worked to make these um, a reality, and while we are not going to be perfect the first round, we're certainly going to make progress to get these in the hands of our families. On Thursday of last week, we celebrated Veterans Day, which is a federal holiday in the United States, observed annually on November 11th to honor people who have served in the United States Armed Forces. Thank you to all those men and women who have served their country as a member of one of the branches of the United States military. We appreciate your service to our country. I also want to highlight another holiday, which is Hanukkah, beginning this Sunday, November 28th, and ending not this Sunday, next Sunday, November 28th, ending the evening of Monday, December 6th. Hanukkah means dedication and is an eight-day wintertime celebration during which Jews commemorate a miracle that occurred more than 2,000 years ago. During this festival of lights, families light the menorah, recite blessings, and enjoy symbolic games. I'd like to wish our Jewish families peace and light this holiday season. Now the treat for tonight. Please join me in welcoming Mary Lee Larned and Milo Bustany of San Marcos High School. They are both part of the San Marcos High School Theater program. They will be performing a piece from one of the greatest all-time American plays, Our Town. Please join me in welcoming them while they get set up. Sorry if that hurts your feelings, but I've got to tell the truth and shame the devil. Change? What do you mean? Well, up to a year ago, I used to like you a lot, and I would watch you as you did everything, because we've been friends so long. And then you started spending all of your time at baseball, and you hardly ever stopped to speak to anybody. Not even your own family, you didn't. And George, it's a fact. You've gotten awful conceited and stuck up, and all the girls say so. They may not say it to your face, but that's what they all say behind your back. And it hurts me to hear them say it, but I've got to agree with them a little. I'm sorry I said all that, but no, I can't be sorry I said it. I'm glad you said it. I didn't know such a thing could be happening to me. I guess it's hard for a fellow not to have faults for into his character. Well, I always expect a man to be perfect, and I think he should be. <laughs> I think it's impossible to be perfect now. Well, my father is. And as far as I can see, your father is too. There's no reason on earth why you shouldn't be. Well, I feel like it's the other way around. That men aren't naturally good, but girls are. Well, you might as well know right now that I'm not perfect. We, it's harder for us girls to be perfect. We are more more nervous. Now, I'm sorry I settled that. I don't know what made me say it. Now, thinking back, 
I really don't know what you say it, and it suddenly feels not important at all. I mean, like, would you like an ice cream soda or, or something before you go home? They're so expensive. No, don't don't worry about that. We're we're celebrating our election, and then you know what else I'm celebrating? No. I'm celebrating because. I've got a friend who tells me the things that ought to be told. George, please don't think of that. It's not no, true. No, no, Emily, you stick to it. I'm glad you said those things, but I'll, I'll change. I'm going to change so quick, you'll see. And, Emily, I want to ask you a favor. What? If I go away to State Agriculture College next year, will you write me a letter once in a while? I certainly will. I certainly will, George. You know, it seems that being away three years, you get out of touch with things. Maybe letters from Grover's Corner wouldn't be so interesting after a while. I mean, Grover's Corner isn't very important when you think of all of New Hampshire. <laughs> they wouldn't come when I wouldn't want to know everything that goes on around here. I know that's true. Listen, listen. Um, what you said about me, about that fault of my character, you were right. But, but there was one thing wrong in it, and that was when you said that for a year, I wasn't noticing people. And you, for example, I, I mean, you said you were, like, watching me all the time, but I was doing the same about you. I always made sure who you were sitting with on the bleachers and who you were talking to, and for three days now, I've been trying to walk home with you, but something's always gotten in the way. I mean, yesterday, I was standing against that wall waiting for you when you walked home with Miss Corcoran. Why, George, life's awful funny why I thought. Listen, Emily, I think, when you found a person you're, you're very fond of, and, or someone who's fond of you too, and likes you enough to be interested in your character, I think that's just as important as college. Or maybe even more so. I think it's awfully important too. Emily? Yes, George? Emily, if I do improve, and I make a like, big change, would you be, I mean, I mean, could you be? I, I don't know. I always have them. Oh, I guess this is an important talk we've been having. Yes. Yes. Wow, you really drew us into that. Thank you so much. Is it okay with you, Board President, if you just say a few words before I can finish up? If you wanna say a few words to the students. Well, absolutely. <laughs> I, I wish you could see behind my mask. I'm just smiling so broadly. When I was a drama teacher, I always taught our town. This Thornton Wilder classic is amazing. And also, your performances were so stellar. Great memorization, great characterization. I think we all felt exactly what you were trying to portray. So I'm very grateful and so proud of you. Thank you. One more round of applause. So I'll just wrap up. Please. Um, if we can just go to our last slide, Mr. Rouse. Finally, board members. Um, in my first year teaching, I was given an award by my colleagues. It was called the Pollyanna Award <laughs> because of my eternal optimism. And while I feel that, and as I hear uh, how much many people in our community are suffering after the aftermath of COVID, with feelings of isolation, ever-changing COVID rules, fear, anxiety, and I want to acknowledge those feelings. And at the same time, I want to offer that during this season of Thanksgiving and gratitude, Many of the ways that I have been able to overcome some of those feelings is by just reminding myself of the things that I can be grateful for, like my 80 and 84 year old parents who are still with me, thank God, and strong. Um, the opportunity to lead this district, my family, my friends, and most importantly, the fact that I get to live in a place where I can work in a job that I can lead with integrity and passion. So may we all remember to be grateful next week and count our blessings. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you so much. Uh, one more congratulations to our student scholars, our athletes, our performers, and you go, Principal Woodard, so well deserved, and we appreciate your powerful approach. Board members, please join me in another round of applause for everyone. 
So before we go to the COVID report, I would just like to congratulate our four December retirees tonight. We have Patricia Pimentel, who will, all of them are uh, either retiring at the end of December or at the end of the school year. We have Patricia Pimentel, who is the budget manager in the district business office with 37 plus years of service to our district. Amazing. We also have Enrique Avala, who is the lead custodian at Lucumbre Junior High School with 15 plus years of service. And Clara Espino, uh, the registrar at San Marcos High School with 24 years of service. And Roger Kuntz, the teacher and coach from San Marcos High School with 15 plus years of service. On behalf of the board, we wish you a wonderful retirement filled with rest, relaxation, fun, family, and friends. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Wagenick for the COVID-19 number 31 report. Good evening, uh, Dr. Maldonado, President Ford, members of the board. Uh, as Ms. Ford said, board report number 31 on COVID. So here we go. Um, as always, our factors that we consider, we continue to try to frame this report around important news in the areas of research and understanding the oversight and support that we receive from outside agencies, um, comprehensive testing programs that continue to evolve, um, vaccines as they be continue to evolve, and then of course our community transmission both um, in our county and in the district. So um, in terms of our case rate, um, next slide. In terms of our case rate per 100,000 um, in the district, as of um, the 9th of November, that case rate, is there, thank you. I was gonna say, is there any way to move me? Uh, was 9.8 per 100,000 in the county. Um, the goal the next uh, marker or goal for the county is less than six per 100,000. Um, public health has announced that once we get below six per 100,000, that is when the mask requirement indoors uh, will be lifted. I wanna remind folks though that public health, county public health does not um, uh, dictate mask wearing for schools. That is a statewide requirement. So um, mask wearing will continue indoors. But yes, as a county, we're shooting for that. Six per 100,000. Next slide, please. All right, and you can see uh, in the county as we move forward, how many folks are vaccinated by age. Um, uh, normally we talk about the younger students, um, younger folks in the county, but we'll, I wanna point to the uh, 65 and older, actually the 50 and older, I'll include my age group in there, and uh, 50 and older in excess of 80 to 85% vaccinated in the county. Really great numbers there. We have exceeded the 50% mark, we're at about 55% fully vaccinated, ages 12 to 15, and um, in, in excess of 60% vaccinated, at least partially uh, 12 to 15 year olds. Um, at the next board meeting in December, we will have percentage vaccinated by age in the zero to 11 age group, because as we all know, five to 11 year olds are now eligible for vaccination. Next slide, please. We can um, 
look at our cumulative data as of November 10th, 2021. Um, in terms of our testing result, we have tested over 7,700 students. Our positivity rate is 0.9%, which continues to be um, a good um, positivity rate. Indicates that we do not have um, high levels of COVID in our schools. We have 96% of our regular employees uh, fully vaccinated and then 4% of our regular employees uh, not vaccinated. That is 69 uh, individuals out of um, nearly 1,700. In terms of testing consent, um, I shared with you at the last meeting that our secondary students would begin um, participating in random testing. That began um, on the 8th. And both elementary and secondary schools are using random testing now. We have achieved 65% testing consent for secondary students and are still working with another 35% of our families on getting that testing consent. In terms of vaccination status, <coughs> I do want to note that this, this points to those who have provided us with their vaccination verification. Each day we continue to get more vaccination cards turned in um, to verify vaccinations, especially as students are chosen to be part of the random testing. Um, our junior high and high school assistant principals who are in charge of safety are reporting that students are bringing their cards in when they have been chosen for random testing. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, again, w awaiting response from over 50% of our students. Next slide, please. There we have our, our headlines. And um, the first headline for this meeting is that some parents want to wait to vaccinate their kids. But here's why doctors say do it now. Uh, many pediatricians urge parents not to wait to vaccinate their children ages 5 to 11. First, because their children will still be at risk for getting sick from COVID-19, uh, especially with the, um, with the current variant. Uh, Dr. Tina Tan, a pediatrician and infectious disease specialist at Northwestern and Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago said, you can't wait until millions and millions of doses are given before you decide because this virus is going to take every opportunity it can to infect someone. Even though COVID-19 cases are trending downward, 90% of counties in the US are still classified by the CDC as having, quote, high or substantial viral spread. Because the Delta variant is that much more transmissible, kids can get Delta and can get quite sick from it, says Tan. You cannot predict in a normal healthy child who's going to get very sick and who's not. Vaccinating is the best way to protect your child against getting severe COVID illness. Our second headline is that the CDC released its COVID-19 guidelines for the 2021 holidays. And here's what you need to know. And if we think back to last Thanksgiving, there were a whole lot of guidelines and this was all new to us, but this year's guidelines are pretty straightforward. First and foremost, get vaccinated. That way, if you're exposed, your illness will not be as, um, as serious. Second, they're still encouraging us to celebrate holidays outdoors if we can. And of course, here in California, we're very fortunate um, that we have the kind of weather where perhaps we can do our Thanksgiving meals outside. But wear your face mask indoors um, if you cannot uh, eat outdoors. And finally, if you're traveling, do so safely. Meaning, um, follow all, thank you, follow all mitigation um, efforts. Use those slices of the Swiss cheese, wear your mask, um, get vaccinated, maintain distance, etc. And finally, how does a pandemic start winding down? Well, you're looking at it. 
Um, I think myself included, many of us thought that there would perhaps be a celebration at the end of COVID. And we would say, it's now over and it's done. Um, that thought for me uh, waned many months ago. And um, experts are saying that we're looking at the end of the pandemic. It is winding down. It doesn't really ever end. COVID will not end. But we really just kind of stop caring as much about it, much as we think of the flu. It will always be with us. But it just sort of fades into the background of our lives. Um, there could still be a winter surge since respiratory viruses thrive when people huddle in heated rooms. But some experts say that um, at least a moderate uptick in infections over the next uh, few weeks and months is expected, much as we experience with the flu. Last year's brutal winter, um, which peaked in January, was just getting started at this point last year. Um, in, especially in warmer weather climates like California, so long as we practice our mitigation and go about our business and are resigned to the new normal, uh, we should be able to uh, see our rates reduce um, and get used to living with COVID. Um, even as we see surging numbers in some of the cold weather states, um, it is good to announce that the trends nationally, including here in California, are favorable. With most people vaccinated and infection rates dropping, the United States has entered a new phase of the pandemic in which people are adapting to the persistent presence of an endemic, but usually non-lethal pathogen. We really have no choice. The virus isn't going away and ultimately we will learn to live with it, each in our own way. There'll be no celebration uh, to mark the end of the pandemic. Rather, we will simply adapt to this new evolving normal. And that is it for uh, COVID board report number 31. I will entertain questions or comments you might have. Oh, there are two more slides. I apologize. Oh, our rates. Um, I am pleased to say that um, as a, in terms of last week's cases, we had one student and one staff member um, positive. That, that is definitely a good direction. In total, we've had 113 students positive and 31 staff members. Um, and I do know that we have had many questions about um, identifying um, the vaccination rates of those who are positive um, and, and who are vaccinated and those who are positive and unvaccinated. What I can say is that in, in terms of our staff, the numbers are still too low for us to give those numbers and feel uh, safe that we are not violating HIPAA. Um, with students, the numbers are higher, yet we don't have reliable data yet on who is vaccinated and who's not. Because some families may choose not to uh, give that information. That is their right on whether to give that information or not. So we do not feel that we have um, fully reliable data um, to be able to share that. What I can say is that because we know that, especially amongst our staff, the vast majority um, of our staff are vaccinated, you're going to say, see a higher number of folks who are positive for COVID being vaccinated. But the rate at which the vaccinated um, contract COVID overall versus the unvaccinated is a whole different story. And uh, then again, the 96% vaccination rate, uh, something we are happy about. And the final slide. That is the final slide. 
Okay, I'm not sorry. I'm not seeing my slides well. Could you advance that, please? Okay, that is the final slide. Okay. Thank you. Now I'll open it for questions. Oh, and thank comments. you. <laughs> the first thing that we will do, uh, first, I would like to re remind the board and the public that this is a report item only. There is no action that will be taken on anything related to COVID tonight by the board. And members of the public, it is now time for public comment on this report. Please use your Zoom icon to raise your hands. Now, Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this item? Good evening, President Ford. Yes, we do have public comment on this item. And I will start with naming the first five names. Um, Chadwick, Ann Thomas, Brian, Justin Shores, phone number ending in 7800, and Robin Dunbar. I will begin with Chadwick. Can you please state your full name? Can, can you please come back to me after the next person? I'm struggling with my internet right now. Sure. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ann Thomas. Ann Thomas, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Wonderful. Dear Superintendent Maldonado and members of the school board, three months into the school year and 113 students and 31 staff have tested positive for COVID. What, have, what you have yet to share with parents is how many of those cases were previously vaccinated. So I asked, the head district nurse got back to me with the following. 30% of all cases were within previously vaccinated students, staff, teachers as, early, as of early October. 30%. We're not talking about the odd isolated breakthrough case here. We're looking at 30% of all cases. This is a very large number. Why has this not been shared with parents yet? Is this inconvenient information? This leads me to my next question. Why is the district now doing some random testing of only the non-vaccinated students and this will miss at least 30% of all potential cases? Why ignore all the cases amongst the vaccinated kids and staff? Remember, they represented 30% of all cases as of early October. Unless you include all vaccinated kids and teachers and staff in the random testing program, your program is discriminatory and has no value. I would go as far as calling it harassment. It will only provide biased data and will fail to be effective at catching as many COVID cases as possible. Not to mention that so far that this random testing has been conducted without protecting the privacy of the students. Students have been gathered as a group in one room to get tested and had full knowledge that those getting tested were also not vaccinated. I'm this huge time. Thank you. The next speaker is Chadwick. Okay, so here we are again outside in the cold speaking to the board or more like speaking to a brick wall that lies between us and you. As a reminder that our board does not want to hear what the community is desperately pleading for, acknowledgement, representation, and change. To highlight your hypocrisy, the argument that we the people cannot hold court in your presence for health reasons is underscored by your allowance of dancers to come and perform in groups to your pleasure and with your applaud. Can one of the board members please speak up during the discussion time and respond to this question? If six dancers are allowed to come in and perform for you, why can't six taxpayers who pay your salaries come in and share their heartfelt concerns with you? Laura, would you please answer that question for us? And please explain, how can you justify using district money to pay to have a private security guard babysit mothers, fathers, students, children, and infants here in a parking lot? But you can go ahead and fire an SRO who's the first line of defense on campus if something like a gang beating were to happen on San Marcos campus. Sound familiar? Paying to protect yourselves against verbal dissent to your political policies and not paying or caring to protect the students in our district from physical violence or sex abuse. Kate, can you please respond to this? Thank you. 
I think our next speaker is Brian. Brian, can you please state your full name? Brian Campbell, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. So they compare these code vaccines to measles and polio vaccines, which is really poor judgment on their part. When was your last measles or polio booster? After those vaccines, did you get sick? No. Did you get other people sick? No. Did those vaccines still spread those diseases? Yes. Do COVID vaccines prevent the spread of getting sick? No. I've shared the videos and articles with the board and superintendent. Four days ago, Dr. Fauci on a podcast said, they are seeing a waning of immunity and an increase in hospitalizations and deaths amongst the vaccinated. He said, we are seeing more and more people getting breakthrough infections and more and more of those people who are getting breakthrough infections are winding up in the hospital. According to Fauci, researchers did not have the time to do the extensive studies. He continued to say, we don't have the proof yet. The proof of the pudding will be after you get people vaccinated and boosted. That's right. They're using the American public in a global clinical trial. Last month, the CDC director Walensky stated on CNN to Wolf Blitzer, vaccines do not prevent transmission of the disease. Vaccines only protect the individual who got vaccinated from severe disease. Unlike measles and polio vaccines that did stop the spread of those diseases, so far, these COVID vaccines are completely different than any other vaccine that we've had before. The CDC announced they have no record of naturally immune I'm people trans. Thank you. Next speaker is Justin Shores. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on, I'm gonna walk up. The Santa Barbara Unified School Board has failed our community in many ways. They've created a mental health crisis by choosing not to apply for a waiver when the governor offered them during the purple tier last summer. While other schools in the area gave students the option for in-person learning, this board decided not to even apply for the waiver. Their inaction compiled the already poor results that, were, that they were responsible for prior to the pandemic. This has caused learning loss that will take years to be fully evaluated according to this the grand jury case that came out yesterday. While other schools around the state and nation listen to science, this board listened to the politicians and lobbyists. They continue to use the pandemic to keep parents out of the board meetings while allowing others to come in at their personal discretion. This board has also hired Hilda Maldonado behind closed doors during the pandemic saying, we have found the perfect candidate with little or no transparency to the public. Superintendent Maldonado has created a hostile environment for the students and teachers, according to her report card that was just recently compiled. She's also took the, the heat, or uh, Super, uh, Superintendent Matsuoko took all the heat for the MAD Academy, but this board hasn't changed at all. In fact, you've gotten late, uh, less transparent since. So not the fix that the parents were calling for and not a good fix for our community. Um, you continue to ignore parents' reactions Hi. to their policy. Next speaker is phone number ending in 7800. Please state your full name. Yes, Afanasios Kaepernickus. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, I'm very big into science and protecting our youth and the population at large. My concern is that here in California, we're putting ourselves out there being pioneers in COVID vaccine experimentation on our kids. I'm not anti-vax, and I might, in fact, be pro-COVID vax in time. But at this time, I'm not about to experiment on the kids. We all know there's limited data on these vaccines and the fact that the disease is quite new. So that means there's limited short-term data and no long-term data. That's none. It makes little sense to roll this out to all the kids just to see what happens. So that, I then have to look at why I would be okay with my kids being forced to be immunized with a new vaccine when we already have high efficacy antiviral pills that work for anyone that contracts COVID. We have natural immunity, vaccines, and antivirals. We're speaking of a death rate that's similar to the flu, but the hysteria is off the charts. Hysteria not consistent with the risk. The mandates and the two-tier citizenship that I see unfolding against the unvaxxed points to unintended consequences of discrimination. Now, SB Unified will be <clears throat> doing so-called random sampling on only the unvaxxed kids, despite there being other ways to assess the case rates. This is not so random and targets kids of color, including my Hispanic daughter, who have lower vax rates per the CDC. In fact, my daughter's teacher was asking about the vax status just the other day in the classroom. I have a problem with that. 
There's simply no place for such, so much risk to, be, to put under our children for such limited gain. The risk-reward is simply not there. I worry that it'll be too late years down the road. Perhaps right. not, but still not the reason. Thank you. The next speaker is Robin Dumbar. Hello, uh, my name's uh, Robin Dunbar. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, I have a 12-year-old son, a uh, resident of Santa Barbara. Um, regarding the COVID-19 report, uh, she sort of ended saying that we have no choice. Uh, I strongly disagree with that. Um, against the uh, vaccine mandates, uh, basically agree with what the previous uh, commenter said. More or less, um, what else? Basically, I think when you do randomly test students, as the first speaker said, you know, other students around, as junior highs and high schools are, even elementary schools, you know, they're going to start pointing fingers and, you know, looking at their friends and maybe their friends don't want to share if they're vaccinated or not. Or um, so the testing itself, I don't know who approved that on the board and how that even passed in the first place, but I believe that's uh, inherently wrong as well as the mandating of the vaccines as well. And I just wanted to uh, make that public uh, comment to you and hope that we can have some sort of special meeting in the future to uh, address these continuing issues. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, phone number ending in 2198. Please state your full name. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Lori Creva. I came to my first board meeting here in person on October 26th, and I'm back this week as a speaker outside in your parking lot. Why is it that a publicly elected school board is not in conversation face to face with the public by now, but other businesses and organizations in town are? I have a 10 year old son and I am pro choice in all matters of health. I am here to ask you to stop school vaccine mandates. Many people I know who have already been vaccinated themselves are questioning giving these injections to kids at such a rapid speed without more safety and efficacy data. They, as do I, believe we are headed down the wrong path. They also didn't know the manufacturers of these shots are released from all liability for vaccine injury and death, or that trials were cut short. Of the 3,000 vaccinated 5 to 11-year-olds in the Pfizer trial, an initial group of 1,500 were followed for two months. 1,500 were later added at the request of the FDA to allow for investigation of serious adverse events for just 2.4 weeks. Long-term adverse events of the vaccine and virus are unknown. It was not until millions of doses were given to young males that myocarditis was seen. And where there is risk, there must be choice. Please stop school vaccine mandates. In an October 29th study published Time. in The Lancet. Thank you. Next is Briggs. Briggs, can you please state your full name? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, Briggs Waco. Uh, hello everyone and thanks for being here. Uh, sorry you guys are all out here in the cold. Too bad we can't be in there with you guys. It's very unfortunate, like the uh, nice lady before you, or before me, just uh, stated. Um, you are a failed appointed staff uh, who is not speaking for the community you're supposed to represent. You are picking the side rather than the freedom of choice. You are completely, and maybe even knowingly, by the way, uh, ruining people's lives. Uh, it's disgusting. It's un-American. All of this, let me say it again, all of this would go away if you stood tall and represented American morals, but you won't. You guys are cowards. You hide behind this China virus as long as you can, and it's pathetic. The American demand and the demand of this community is simple. Ban vaccine mandates, ban mask mandates, and this critical race theory stuff. If you guys say that it's not in our schools, ban it. All of our schools should not have it. The adults in the room are here, we're here to stay, and might I add, growing rapidly in numbers every day. You guys are facing a, uh, a huge, huge, huge lion, and uh, you're gonna be uh, 
gone publicly from your uh, your speaking podiums pretty soon. Thank you. I think your next speaker is Danny Blunk. Hi, I'm here in the parking lot too, in the cold. And I am here because I am homeschooling my daughter, 15 year old, because she did fail Zoom as you did not apply for the waiver to have them in person. She has this streaming anxiety. She doesn't want to go back to school. You failed her. You should have done what was right. And also now mandated these vaccines that nobody show us the ingredients. I keep asking the ingredients. If you're mandated, you have the responsibility to show us what is in it, in, in it. So we know what we're putting in our kids' body. Why is it so complicated to do that? If you show many slides with numbers of COVID, how about the ingredients? You say safe, how can we know if we don't know what is in it? People go to supermarket and read labels of what is in the food. Why can't we know what is we put in our kids' body? So please stop any mandates. And also the masks. And the masks are not good for the kids. How can they be learning when they don't have enough oxygen in their brains okay how about you test what the mask is doing to them how about you chat chat with them ask them okay and you failed my kid and that's very disappointing and that is a lot of things coming out of your incompetence i wonder if soon is gonna come out that you always put our kids kids in danger with this vaccine thank you thank you thank you next speaker is patty campos sapansky Hi, this is Patricia Shapansky, and I just want to voice my opinion that I am against all mandates. And I would also like to know why meeting after meeting, people ask questions and want answers and nobody ever responds. What are you guys hiding? Why can't you answer the questions that the people of Santa Barbara want to know? Thank you. Thank you. President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you very much, members of the public and Ms. Trujillo. At this time, I would like to ask board members if they have any further questions or comments related to Dr. Wagonet's report. Ms. Caps? No, I'm good, thank you. Seeing no comments, we will move on to our next um, agenda item, which is board comments and correspondence. And we'll start with Ms. Munoz, please. Yes, um, good evening. Uh, I thank you so much for the performance that was done by our San Marcos High School students. Um, it was a joy to see their talent and how they drew us in with their performance. Thank you so much to them, to the te drama teachers and to the parents. Um, <clears throat> this past Friday night, I had the pleasure of going to the San Barbara High School uh, football game along with Ms. Sims um, Moten. We were there for the Santa Barbara High playing Newport Harbor for the CIF football playoffs. Um, they were to give our support and it was great to see the alumni and the students and the athletes um, and giving it um, all their effort. I'd also like to remind folks about the Youth Makers uh, Market that's coming up this Sunday. Um, we had had the two young ladies come and speak to our uh, at our board meeting previously, and it will be on Sunday, November 21st from 11 to 2 p.m. at the San Barbara High Senior Lot. And a great example of these young uh, boys and girls, our students that are having, you know, their opportunity to be entrepreneurs and, and such. So I'm hoping that we will give their su them support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Sims Moten, please. Thank you. I also enjoyed having a front row seat of the performance this evening. I don't often get to get front row and sitter, so I really appreciated that today. And it was, and again, as as everyone has said, it really drew, drew me into what they were saying and wanted to really follow up on it. 
Um, and then I, yeah, I attended on Friday with whose house? Dawn's house, you know, on Friday football. I, can you tell I'm really excited about football? <laughs> I thought, you know, although the outcome wasn't what we expected or hoped for, they did a really good job, and I enjoyed uh, being there and watching them play, realizing they're a young team, and so I know that they're going to be a force to be reckoned with next year as well. So I just wanted to express that um, you know, my excitement and hope for the next season. Um, and also just also congratulations to Principal Woodard and is it Iman is the student's name? Yeah, yeah. congratulations on that. Wow, to be able to be a part of um, what our future is looking like in inventors and how they're using innovation to change how we look at things and how we learn things. So much appreciated for the things that they're doing there as well. I'm also really excited about the pre-K and, and K enrollment December 1st, and hopefully I'll be able to get to one of those um, to cheer those young ones on. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you. And then I, I would like to say, you know, as we continue to go forward, and thank you, Dr. Wagnett, for that report on, on COVID. And we will look back on this time um, and say how well we've done in reclaiming our space, continue to be open and um transparent about what it is that we're doing and keeping um, students centered in terms of our decisions that we have to make. And I heard someone say that when you're making the right decision, you don't have to think twice about it. So I know it's hard in the midst of us, they having to do those things, but we know we are continuing to put our students um, in the forefront of, of what we're doing and that we will definitely reclaim our teaching and learning um, environment, which is healthy and thriving. So thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Caps. Thanks everyone. I'm sorry I'm not with you in the room there. I'm under the weather and awaiting a test. So appreciate um, being able to join this way safely. And I wanted to uh, pick up on where Dr. Maldonado left off with heading into the holidays and a time of a real thanks, both Thanksgiving, but also Hanukkah. Um, it's, um, there's so much stress. There's so much fraught. We say this every meeting and at different capacities but it's worth acknowledging every time because we do as members of the board serve as voices of the community and from teachers and students and parents with vaccine questions to students worried about police to, I mean, you, you honestly couldn't spend this whole meeting listing um, all of the concerns and stressor, stress points and challenges that we um, as our school district are facing and really our schools are emblematic of who we are. And this is a very challenging time in our country and our globe. And I just wanna give voice to it, uh, hopefully as a, an acknowledgement that we are listening to you. It might not feel like that. It's a very divisive time, but, we, but I am, we are, and we're doing what we know to be true. And if anything, I just wish um, as we step back into this time of thanks, um, it's, it's conference week this week, so school is out earlier and teachers are having those engaging conversations with parents to talk about their children, just to step back a bit and take note and have grace and give thanks. And with that, I wanna give thanks to our fearless leader, board president Ford, who celebrated a big birthday this last week. And I'm so grateful for her presence in my life and her work on this board and this, this big birthday that she celebrated. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Caps. Ms. Alvarez is going to be joining us a little later in the meeting, so I'll go ahead with my comments and then we'll follow up with uh, Dawson Kelly's comments. I've been thinking a lot about um, all the issues that have been mentioned today as we address the current pandemic, and yes, it's not over, as well as the past challenges of the worst of the pandemic and the continuing serious divide in our country. It really troubles me and I'm giving it a lot of thought these days. It's important to me that even in our little town, we work to mend fences, compromise, consider different viewpoints and collaborate for the betterment of our community and our country. Staying involved in the process is essential, whether it's about instruction, board area trustees, or even school schedules. So I am grateful to those of you who have reached out to the board. I had the opportunity to learn about more about the trustee areas and attend the community meeting um, recently. And it was really well attended, thank you so much. And members of the community made many important comments and asked really great questions. 
I also hope that everyone had a meaningful Veterans Day. Both my parents were veterans, the Navy and the Marine Corps, and on Veterans Day I always reflect on how proud they were to serve our country. Also, this Saturday at 11 a.m., the public is invited to the memorial to honor Sam Cunningham, the great Santa Barbara Don, athlete and person. So I'll see you at Peabody Stadium. And with that, Mr. Kelly, do you have comments tonight? Yes. Um, so first, as you all know, uh, last meeting, I announced that I was running for the California State Board of Education and that I was a semifinalist in the top 12. Um, unfortunately, I did not get the position, but I was still invited to go to the SABE conference, which stands for the Student Advisory Board on Education, which is run by CASC, which is the California Association of Student Councils. And at that conference, I met with around 100 students from across California that are all super involved in education. So these could be student board members, ASB presidents, um, all people involved in all kinds of education advocacy or school leadership. And uh, it was one of the best conferences I've ever been to, especially as a board member. Um, it was important and I learned so much about all the different issues that these school districts face uh, and how they've resolved some issues, especially as it seems as we are more divided than ever, how these students have taken it upon themselves to come together and compromise. So that was a great experience. Uh, and that's all for my update. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're really proud of you, Dawson. And now, uh, it, this time, it's uh, time for our opportunity for comments from the public about items that are not on the agenda tonight. Each speaker is allotted 90 seconds, as I've mentioned before. And please remember the new protocol, raise your hand on Zoom to be recognized. Ms. Trujillo, do we have any public comments to address items that are not on the agenda? Thank you, President Ford. Yes, we do have public comment on this item. Okay. And I will start with Sharfell. Then we'll go Sheridan Rosenberg, Chadwick, Nicole Montalvo, phone number ending in 2198. And I will begin with Sharfell. Can you please state your full name? Sharfell, can you please unmute yourself? Um, I'm not getting a response. I will go to the next um, speaker and come back. Next speaker is Sheridan Rosenberg. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I want to address two things very quickly. One, I believe that this is a blatant Brown Act violation and discriminatory when you allow people inside the boardroom to, to perform. We're all fans of the performing arts and especially children who engage in that. But leaving parents outside, and Hilda, you made the excuse that anybody coming inside had proof of vaccination or had a test, I could certainly pass both. And I'm sure a lot of those people in the parking lot could pass both, but they're not being given an option, which I believe is a flagrant and blatant Brown Act violation. You're discriminating and it's not okay. And you need to change it. You can certainly put people in the overflow room, put a podium and microphone back there. And hey, people who wanna come in, it, it, it could be a level playing field, as you said before. I now wanna address the, the unbelievably insulting uh, gesture of wishing us a happy Hanukkah when I certainly was in attendance at the uh, B'nai B'rith Community Forum that you conducted, which was so flagrantly anti-Semitic with the presence of Art Nelson Concordia, Sean Carey, Hilda Maldonado, when they pointed out that Jews of color apparently are the ones who qualify for the ethnic studies curriculum. And you not only owe us an apology, why are you still here? Why haven't you resigned for being openly and blatantly anti-Semitic. By the way, you really need to restore the three minute clock. This is ridiculous. It's done so we can't be heard. Time. Thank you. Next speaker is Chadwick. Please state your full name. 
Hi, my name is Erin Chadwick. So because you did not listen to your district teachers, staff and faculty, they were represented by others who did. The Santa Barbara Teachers Association sent out a per perception survey to the entire district asking how everyone felt the superintendent was doing at her job. I know this because my husband is a teacher. I want you guys to know that the report card and reflection of the entire district's disgust and exasperation with Hilda and her leadership is 100% a reflection of every single person sitting on the board tonight. You hired her, you enthusiastically endorsed her, and you have used her for your furthering of dividing, discriminating, and degrading the staff, students, and citizens you were elected to serve. Had your names been on that perception poll, they would have needed to add a zero to the grading score. And maybe that will be the next poll that needs to go out to the district and community. You are failing us. You are failing the kids. And any board that continues to unanimously vote passing protocols that now completely shamed superintendent, that now a completely shamed superintendent endorses is a board that cannot and will not represent us moving forward. You have gone rogue and you do not have the support or trust of the people. If there is any heartbeat left in any of you that cares for those you serve, now is the time to repent and begin a process of reconciliation and building back our trust. Or remove yourselves and allow caring, concerned, and empathetic human beings who take the oath. Next speaker is Nicole Montalvo. Nicole, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Sorry about that, technical difficulties. All right, so the thing that I wanna to touch on tonight, it's tough to figure out one thing that you uh, wanna spend your time on. Anyway, the board recently made a decision to remove the uh, safety resource officers who protect our campuses. And that move was so alarming that Sheriff Bill Brown himself had to publicly call you out and ask you to reverse your decision. On Wednesday, November 10th, the principal of San Marcos and I notified parents that there were quote, a series of serious incidents on campus in which multiple students physically assaulted an individual student, end quote. The SRO's last day on campus was two days after that notice was sent out. When the decision to terminate the SRO contract was made, there were at least two active cases on San Marcos' campus alone involving hard drugs. As a survivor of childhood trauma myself, I cannot fathom that a group of adults, let alone a group comprised of fellow parents, would willingly end up our children at further risk. Members of the board, I have to ask you this. How do you profess to prioritize the safety of our children when your actions say otherwise? Removal of the safety officer from campuses where serious assaults are taking place is senseless, illogical, and dangerous. If anything, there should be an increase in the presence of safety officers on our campuses. Our children deserve better from you. Your code of ethics states that you will seek communication between the board and the community, as well as communicate to the board. Thank you. Next speaker is um, with phone number ending in 29, I'm sorry, 2198. Please state your full name. Hi, uh, Lori Creva. can you hear me? Yes, thank you, go ahead. I didn't realize time had been cut down. So I just wanted to share the Lancet publication as I was talking about stopping school, school vaccine mandates. Uh, quote, fully vaccinated individuals with breakthrough infections have peak viral loads similar to unvaccinated cases and can efficiently transmit infection in household settings, including to fully vaccinated contacts. Basically, household members had the same risk of contracting COVID, whether their exposure was from a fully vaccinated household with infection or an unvaccinated household. It is clear to me whether or not uh, you are vaccinated, you can spread COVID-19. In fact, vaccinated people may be unknowingly and easily transmitting infection to those around them because they may be more likely to have mild or asymptomatic infection and not get tested. So if a vaccine does not prevent children or adults from transmitting disease to others, then basing any of your policy decisions on this idea is poor policy making. In addition, applying different standards to different groups of people, whether for vaccines, masks, or testing is called discrimination. Please stop the school vaccine mandates. 
parents must have the right to choose to vaccinate their child for any number of reasons without blame or shame, as do parents who decide to watch and wait. You are taking, you are not taking the risk. Families are. It is time for this board and our county and state health authorities to pivot. Please Hi, stop school mandates. Thank you. The next speakers, five speakers are Brian, Alice Post, Sharon Jagotka, Kim, Roseanne Crawford, and Justin Shores. I will begin with Brian. Please state your full name. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. I just want to recap that per the CDC director and Dr. Fauci, vaccines do not prevent the spread of COVID. They do not protect you against getting sick. They think it protects the individual from serious illness, but they won't know until more time has gone by and the naturally immune do not spread COVID. All this is not new news and all this is per the CDC director, Walensky, and Dr. Fauci, I suggest you all actually listen to their interviews and not just the sound bites on mass media or whatever you're spoon fed from your higher ups. So why is our school board coercing people to get vaccinated when vaccines don't work? They don't prevent the spread, which is what they said is the reason why they're gonna force you to take it. It's time we fire this board and elect true leaders who will do the hard work of thinking for themselves and acting in the best interest, health and safety of our community and our children. Also, they are not honest about the FDA approved vaccine commonality, which per the FDA approval letter is legally different from the vaccine they are forcing you to take, which is not FDA approved. Pfizer or BioNTech is not FDA approved, but they say it's close enough, but there's no legal rights to anybody who takes this vaccine. They have no right to sue if they're damaged or hurt as we've seen from tens of thousands of people. And as someone else said, where there's a risk, where there's a risk, you need to give Hi. people a choice. Next speaker is Alice Post. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry, my comment is about the trustees, which is on the agenda, so I'm going to pass. Thank you for letting us know. The next speaker is Sharon Jagotka. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I have a son who's in high school. He is at Dos Pueblos and he just recently came home with, with an English assignment. And this English assignment is deeply rooted in critical race theory. And I am of Mexican and Filipino descent. My grandparents came here to America as immigrants. My grandfather and uncle came to America as immigrants from the Philippines. They worked their butt off for a better life and they did it with a good hard work ethic. And that is what my husband and I are instilling in our mestizo children. They are half Mexican, Filipino and white. That's what we are instilling in them. My boys are not oppressed. They are not oppressors and they are not privileged or underprivileged. We are raising them to work hard and whatever it is they wish to be, they can do that with hard work. That's what we need to be teaching these children. Okay, we are spending too much time and money on this, this critical race theory. Laura Capps, you and I went to high school together. English class was not like this. We read classics. Okay, this is an English class and my son is having to write a paper on CRT. It makes no sense. Laura, when you and I were in high school together at Santa Barbara, this is what not what our English class was like. Time. Next speaker is Kim. Kim, can you please state your full name? Hi, my name is Kim Poskage. I see that last week, uh, school resource deputy Hampton was told by San Marcos school administrators that some videos showing multiple assaults happening on campus. I see that the SRD Sean Hampton was on campus when these events occurred, but was not able to prevent them. I see that the SRD did not intervene in real time either during these attacks. Again, I am so sorry to hear that these events occurred, but it falls in line with the data that shows time and time again that school resource officers do not prevent violence on school campuses. 
The school board recognized this truth as well, and we need pre preventative measures based on research and not fear-based band-aid solutions that cause more harm than good. As the conference of mayor says, we cannot arrest our way out of the problem. Prevention is the key to long-term success. San Marcos will still have a line of communication with law enforcement in case of a criminal emergency that needs immediate attention like we saw last week. Campus security will be added to San Marcos and they have relationships with students and they are just as capable as an SRD to identify issues on campus and escalate them to law enforcement if needed. There have been several medical emergencies this year where an ambulance has had to come to campus, but we do not spend funds on stationing an EMT on campus. That does not make sense because you only call them when there is an emergency. Same with armed police. A police officer does not need to be stationed on campus for 1500 hours. They can be called if there is an emergency or something needs to be Thank investigated. You. Thank you. Next speaker is Roseanne Crawford. Good evening. Uh, earlier in the evening in closed session, we were not privy to Dr. Maldonado's evaluation. These are my observations. Unprecedented is the biggest turnover in staff administra um, and administration we have ever had. In less than six months, 19 teachers and staff were moved from McKinley to uh, institute the questionable DLI meta program that is actually very discriminatory and will not help uh, close the achievement gap. It'll make it worse. Uh, we have never lost so many key administrators. The initiation and, excuse me, uh, I just, it's such an emotional thing, really. We want the best for our kids and you're just not doing it. The intimidation of teachers and the lack of support has never been more blatant. We do not need the failed politics of the Los Angeles Unified School District and their low literacy rates in Santa Barbara. Policies are being put in place that exacerbate tracking and are discriminatory. Bring back strong English and math curriculum, please, if you are serious about closing the achievement gap. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Justin Shores. Thank you. Um, sorry. When we uh, when we do it in public comment earlier, I tried to get on at 4.30 for the superintendent's report and wasn't able to get on. And I know a lot of people were trying to comment then. You, you gave us about 30 seconds to raise our hand and then went into the closed session. Um, we should have an opportunity to speak, especially for people that are technically um, challenged. How are how is somebody going to be able to participate in the in the meetings if you guys are, are just pushing through it so quick without any regard to the people that have been taking their time and you know planning their day around this meeting to try to come speak that we don't we don't get paid for this we don't have this you know this is something we have to do as a sacrifice and we're doing it as a sacrifice because we do care about our community we care about our kids and all of us out here are here to to voice our dissent and get this on file. So when we when we go back and we see the decisions you've made, we could see how many people have put dissent in. And besides the people that are getting paid, um, you know, to, to vaccinate people like Dawes and all them and all like whoever's calling in to support you that's, you know, that's in the vaccine industry, we understand, but I don't hear any other dissent that's, or any other um, people going for these vaccine mandates. So you're supposed to react to the public's, um, to, the, to how, what we say, how we um, come Thank to you, and you're not reacting. You. Our last speaker is Cressida Silvers. Good evening. Uh, I'm Cressida Silvers, and I'm a parent at San Marcos. Thank you so much for your d recent decision, recognizing that armed law enforcement isn't necessary in our schools, that decades of data show they do not make any of our children safer, and that they end up limiting educational access for many children. The terrible events last week at San Marcos sadly provide us with yet another local example in line with the research and the na national data that the presence of armed officers in our schools does not increase safety, 
The student attacks occurred while the armed school resource deputy was still stationed there. He did not prevent, detect, de-escalate, or intervene on these attacks. He was called in after the fact to investigate and arrest, a service that could have been provided by a deputy stationed off campus. As you also wisely indicated, we need other solutions that focus on prevention, on support, and safety. My understanding is that the students involved have had anger management issues in the past. Imagine if instead of spending $150,000 on a deputy to investigate after the fact, we had had more staff on campus, in classrooms, interacting with these students, adults who care about their futures and are trained in the mental health, trauma-centered interventions and de-escalation techniques needed to notice, to provide the support for prevention and protection instead of waiting until difficult students can be removed by arrest and are no longer the school's problem. We can do better and thank you so much for recognizing that. Thank you. And we have one more speaker, Moni DeWitt. Yes, hi Sandra, thank you so much and uh, good evening board. Um, you know, I'm speaking to you tonight again because I'm noticing on the agenda that our district is spending money both on OG for an approach to reading as well as balanced literacy and those are two conflicting methods. The reason why it's important that we use the right approach, which is the science of reading, and there is a movement for this nationwide, Minneapolis parents are protesting to have this as well, is because that's what works. The majority of our students who are not doing well are English language learners, our foster youth, those with learning differences, which you've left out of your agenda on every chart tonight, very disappointing, and also socioeconomic hardship. None of these can learn with Lucy Calkins. That's settled science. Read Emily Hanford, please. I feel sometimes like, um, you know, we would all agree that climate change, based on science, man-made, we need to agree. Lucy Calkins doesn't work. She admits it herself. So we don't want that program. And I really beg the superintendent. These are our most vulnerable students. If you want them to succeed, you want to close the achievement gap. This is tied so much to equity. The whites and Asians make it because they can afford private school and tutoring. You know, this is an equity issue and you cannot turn your backs and teach them in a way that doesn't work for them. It's completely unconscionable. And I, I'm going to make a plenty of noise for it. You're going to be on the wrong side of a movement that is coming your way. And I implore you read right. Emily Hanford and get on. Thank you. President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you very much, Ms. Trujillo and members of the public. At this time, we will move on to the consent agenda to approve the items that are considered routine and not likely to require, in most cases, any discussion. Dr. Maldonado and her staff have recommended that the board approves all of the consent agenda items, and the board also has had an opportunity to consider and ask questions about these items before tonight. So first, are there any public comments on the consent agenda items, Ms. Trujillo? There are no public comment. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. There, I'm sorry. There is one uh, public comment. Okay, please. Thank you. Caroline Hara. Hi, I apologize if this is the wrong one. Is this the consent agenda on the uh, resolution for rigor rigorous learning? No. Okay. Sorry. There's two. I'll, I'll wait my turn. Thank you. Thank you. So board members, before I call for the motion, do you, or Dr. Maldonado, are there any items on the consent agenda that require more information, comments, or discussion? Seeing none, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented on items E2 to E16. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Sims-Moten. And a second. A second. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 The motion passes unanimously. And with that, we will now move on to our hearing, the public hearing about, uh, and it is our third public hearing on trustee area scenarios. First, just to let you know what's happening, Scott Newell, uh, the CEO of Corporate Strat Strategies, will present the now six maps. Two are new and others have been modified. 
because of concerns and great suggestions from the public and from board members. And um, these maps divide the district into five or six trustee areas. After his comments, we'll receive public input on the maps, followed by input from board members. This hearing begins. Scott? Hello. Can you hear me? Thumbs up from somebody? All right, thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, so thanks for having me back again. We're now at our third meeting. And um, tonight there's a couple things that I'm hoping to, to get out of this from my perspective here. First, I would love it if we could maybe um, have some discussion or at least narrow down some finalists uh, from our maps. I wanna discuss a little bit uh, the, the dialogue that occurred at our last community meeting. And then just kind of, uh, put forth the task that's at hand really to consider um, tonight before we move into our final community meeting in a few days and then uh, our final uh, board meeting in December. And so we'll kind of cruise through these first slides quickly. Uh, so next slide, please. So just looking at the calendar right now, and as you can see, we're now at our third meeting. And so tonight, as I mentioned, we'll go over the scenarios to date, hopefully shortlist some, put those back out to the public on the 18th. And then after that, come back with any final revisions, final comments that we had from the public forum, at which time we are uh, hoping that you guys will find a scenario that works best for the school district. And then at that time, um, it'll be submitted to the County Committee on School District Organization sometime in January and February, at which time they can make a motion to approve or deny the redistricting process. Next slide, please. So um, I wanna just stop on this. This is a, a reoccurring theme real quick, but I, I wanna talk about it specifically uh, for tonight, just as you move forward with some thoughts. Um, review the consideration. So, the first two, as I've always mentioned, uh, are requirements. Each area shall contain nearly equal number of inhabitants, and each section shall be drawn to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act. So all the scenarios that we have currently at this third meeting do meet those two requirements. Um, as we've gone through this process and we've made revisions, we've made tweaks, we've really come down to uh, these other considerations as being the key drivers for the school district. And you know it's no surprise to anybody here, but uh, Santa Barbara Unifier is, is unique in the sense of how the overarching boundary is and then the smaller elementary boundaries within. And that presents some challenges uh, to have the perfect scenario uh, from a consideration standpoint. And so really um, when looking at these considerations here, what we've seen through this process is really to Kind of themes emerging for you guys to contemplate and i guess you know the challenge to you um, first you know these decisions will transcend people um, this can be done once every 10 years and so really the task at hand right now is to do something that you think is going to make the most sense for the school district now and in the future um, and that's really looking at these considerations and so uh, we've made some, some tweaks along the way, and we'll discuss those, but there's probably two big ones uh, that you need to contemplate. First is a five trustee scenario, and the second is a seven. And I will say, before we get into the specifics right now, our last community meeting, which was well attended, uh, right around 50 people, I would say, um, the resounding commentary was um, suggesting a seven trustee area scenario. And the main drivers behind that from uh, the notes that I took there were, it reduced the trustee voting sizes by about 10,000 people per voting area, which they felt was a benefit to the district because um, it's just a smaller trustee size. So closer constituents to their people and they thought that was a, a positive there. And their bigger consideration, um, when you look at this list right here, I would say was it fell under the 
the category of respects communities of interest as much as possible. Um, and it did uh, in the particular scenario that they were favoring, um, followed some of the boundaries of the other elementary school districts. And so um, that was the main theme from there. There was a lot of support for that scenario. Now, under that scenario, what it, it doesn't achieve is another consideration, which is location of school sites, and in particular, the elementary sites and the distribution of Santa Barbara Unified sites uh, among trustee areas. And our surveys that we've done online, and then the comments that I've heard from these board meetings here, is that's a, a strong consideration on the other end is to have uh, trustee areas that respect that consideration. And so I'll tell you now, one of the challenges at this present time is the two scenarios, the way that they have to be drawn to comply with the first two requirements, um, they can't do both. Um, so as we move forward, one of the things to really just contemplate again is of these considerations that are up here, which ones make the most sense for the school district, for the people that live in the community and what will uh, serve the school district the best over time. And so uh, those were the key takeaways from our last meeting. And then again tonight, I'm hoping that we can maybe uh, at a minimum check uh, a couple off the list. I think we've got five or six to show tonight. Some are just revisions from previous ones, some are new, but uh, shrink that down a little bit so that when we go to our last community meeting, we can really focus on those um, and the merits of those and then present you with something that hopefully you guys can make a decision on. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just at a, a glance, and we've we've seen this before, this is just your current 2020 census data here. Uh, and as you can see, 190,000 residents and about 160,000 uh, over the age of 18 or, or voting age. Next slide, please. When you look at your CVAP, which is your citizen voting age population, uh, we use the 2015 through 2019 CVAP. And uh, this is important, again, just to kind of look at the spread of what is deemed the protected classes here. And so you can see your district uh, is comprised largely 22% Hispanic Latino, 67.1 white, and 2.3 black, and so on and so forth down there. Next slide, please. Just a quick comparison uh, from 2010 to 2020, uh, grown approximately 7,000 people. Um, and then you can just kind of cruise down and see the change in your demographic spread too. All right, so if we wanna cruise two slides to scenario one, and again, these are all available. Uh, this is the zoomed in version. There's the zoomed in and the blown out version on the website if you wanna look at these more. So this first scenario, a revision that was requested from the last meeting was to try and bump up the CVAP, the Hispanic Latino voting population to have a little more representation. And so if you wanna to go to the next slide here and look at the figures, uh, what we attempted to do there was uh, push up, if you recall, voting area number three last time was 16%. So we were able to push that up some you can see that um, it jumped the variance up almost 3% to do that. So we weren't really able to do much more on that threshold without it then kicking the total variance out of whack. And just as a reminder, variance, uh, again, if you look at the smallest uh, variance in this case, let's just say, um, where is it? We've got Population of 38,119 is the ideal size. And so in this case, 37,300 is our smallest. And then 39,940 is our largest. And so that gives us our variance. And the goal is to be under 10. We listed our key changes on the next slide, which uh, again, the major tweak from this version from the last one is to really make some slight adjustments so that we could bump that up from 16 to almost 18%. Uh, it should be noted to you on that previous one, uh, there's only three trustee areas that are represented in the Santa Barbara Unified um, map there. 
excuse me, in the attendance boundaries. So scenario two, uh, one of the changes was the ability to get four of the trustee areas within Santa Barbara Unified, um, which was you know, good to get more representation in there, but you can see that there wasn't a great blend of school sites in this scenario. Um, in particular, and if you look at the color coding here, trustee area number four doesn't have any school sites on it, um, but it does have voting populace within Santa Barbara Unified. Next slide, please. And with that, um, just from a top requirement standpoint, we have a very low variance here. And if you look at the Hispanic and Latino CBAP, you can see that those spread pretty nicely around that 22.2%. And so that's why it was primarily left in there. Um, and because that was in there, next slide, at the um, last meeting, that was still uh, one of the, I guess, uh, cleanest scenarios. So going to the next uh, scenario here, what we did initially, and we have two, two runs with this, we tried to again keep four trusty areas within Santa Barbara Unified, but move those boundaries around some so that we could get better school site representation. And so uh, from the last meeting, this one here, if you go to the next slide, was one you guys have seen before. It was uh, had more school sites represented. The kind of giveaway of that, you can see that there's a little bit more of a variance in the CBAP uh, high of 26.2, a low of 16.3, but um, you were still all within your variance there. Now, that one I would say based on further revision still isn't one that's um, met those two last considerations we've talked about the most. If you wanna go, um, Next slide, and then the one after. So we come to our first seven trustee scenario here. And this particular one um, was the, of the two scenarios that were presented at our community meeting, the one that was favored the most. Um, in part, because it had, at least on the uh, voting areas that were outside of Santa Barbara Unified, it did have a school site uh, within each of those boundaries there. And then within Santa Barbara Unified, you did have four of the trustee voting areas represented and a decent spread of school sites. Uh, additionally, there was comments that um, they liked that the trustee boundaries, and I'll use um, the blue here, which is number four, for example, largely ran the um, school boundary of, of hope. So, um, you know, of the two scenarios, this was the one that was um, favored at our last community meeting for those reasons. If you go to the next slide, just a few things to point out here. So when you move from a five to a seven, you can see that our ideal trustee area size effectively drops about 10,000 people. And again, that's just dividing the total population out by seven instead of five. And that was something that resonated with the community members that attended the last meeting, that it was a smaller voting area and there would be an opportunity to have a um, closer uh, communication and closer representation with the trustees living in those uh, communities of interest. You can see the variance is five there, um, which isn't too bad. One of the considerations to look at, and again, if you wanna scroll over the Hispanic and Latino CVAP, which again is the gray columns, you can see that seven, six, five, four, and three are pretty close uh, from our previous scenarios. Where you get a little bit um, off, you can see in trustee area number one, you're at 11%, and number two, you're at 42%. And so the number one, essentially, if um, you wanna scroll back real quick, uh, one slide, is in the yellow, so that goes you can see a large portion there of Santa Barbara Unified, and then it goes everything east, okay? And so that's what that encompasses there, and that has 11% representation. And then number two, which is in the green, uh, right down there in, in the bottom, we have a 42% representation. So, um, you know, the merits of, of discussion there would certainly be how you all felt about having a larger variance under that scenario. And then obviously um, 
the way that we have to dice it, you were able to achieve at least one school site, although they weren't elementary schools in the other ones. Um, but these ones are really built more for the communities of interest uh, as a, a consideration and a, a larger consideration than this one. You wanna go forward um, probably two slides or three to scenario five. So scenario five right here uh, were further revisions to scenario three. And this goes back to a five. And as you can see here, the, the goal again was to really focus on consideration around uh, school sites. So if you were to zoom in, you can see a lot of the elementary sites are, are further distributed. And then uh, when you look at your um, high school and junior high sites, you've got multiple schools within number five. Um, within number four, which is the blue area, you don't have a high school or junior high site, but you do capture um, elementary sites, excuse me, and you do have um, one junior high site there. And then in number three, which spans the south portion there, you do pick up San Marcos High School, um, junior high, and two elementary schools. So really it was a look to try to focus on school sites as a key consideration there. If you wanna to go to the next slide. Variance is good at 3.8. Um, you can see from our CVAP on the Hispanic and Latino spread there. It's not as evenly distributed as uh, scenario two, where everything was floating right around 22%, um, but it does allow a better uh, representation of the school sites there. And so that was one of the give and takes under this scenario. And if you wanna scroll ahead two to scenario number six. Number six was our second uh, seven trustee scenario. And I think again, um, you know, the biggest things were, were similar to the other ones in the sense that it was smaller uh, voting areas. Uh, but after discussion during the community meeting, uh, most felt that they liked the other uh, seven scenario better for reasons that I stated. If you go to the next slide, you can see that um, it's very similar in the sense of uh, how things shook out. The variance is a little more. Now, when you look at trust area three, four, five, six, and seven, uh, there's a little bit more variation there, and we still have the same 11% um, to 42% in one and two. And so that's uh, that's where we're at presently. Um, I will say it's again, you guys are in a very unique situation here, and as you can see. Um, there's pros and cons to both, and uh, unfortunately, we can't meet all the considerations. And so I guess right now, I'd, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. And then any discussion as well that can help guide us to getting to uh, a short list, if you will, to keep moving this process forward. Thank you very much, Scott. I will say that uh, the board is not was not informed that it should come forward with some preferences tonight. So I'll invite the board when it's their turn to speak to share preferences, but you'll probably have to just glean what, uh, what you're hearing from all of us. We won't be taking a vote or anything. No problem. Yeah, I'd also on. like to uh, now invite public comment regarding the trustee areas. Ms. Trujillo. Thank you, President Board. We do have public comment. I will Name, uh, call out the first five speakers. Daniel, Daniel Gonzalez, Alice Post, Roseanne Crawford, Eder, Leigh Tepp, Hector Flores Garcia. And I will begin with Daniel Gonzalez. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. All right, uh, thank you uh, board members. My name is Daniel Gonzalez, organizing director with Featured Leaders of America. I'm here today to talk about uh, the concerns that myself and other community members have with the redistricting process that the board has been conducting, as well as the disturbing direction the district, the redistricting has been heading towards. In the past, you know, large scale, at large school board elections have delivered fair representation for the protected classes, which include low, low income Latinx families and youth ensuring they have equal representation in the district. 
As of today, not one single map drawn by the district ensures that communities of interest are protected or equally represented. The five districts districts drafted in various maps have been drawn to suppress, suppress the Latino representation and their voices by those of their wealthy counterparts. It makes no sense to group wealthy affluent communities like the Mesa neighborhood, affluent multi-million dollar homes and homeowners with the West Side neighborhoods, low-income immigrants and renters. They share no common interests or similarities. If SBUSD consists of 59% uh, percent Latino students and the board should be representative of the demographics of the district. If there are five representatives, three of them should come from this protected class. SBUSD redistricting maps need to do a better job of protecting the protected class and ensuring equal representation to the community it serves. I also want to add that at the moment, SBUSD has no tools available on their website for the community to draft their own maps. This is not a transparent process. Okay. Other cities, other districts. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is Alice Post. Hello. Yes, Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. District elections are better than at large. Why? Because at large elections do not guarantee representation and district elections do. First and foremost, I urge you to move to district elections by next fall and not to delay. It would be a great tragedy if we remain at at large elections because they do not represent neighborhoods. They've, I've studied the maps and my second point is seven trustees areas are better than five. Why? Our geographic area is too large to only have five trustee areas. In my opinion, all the maps with five trustees are just awful. But the maps with seven are very, very good. But then my third point, I don't know if you'll let me go over, but I hope you would let me go over 15 seconds. The reason they're so good is because they represent the secondary district so well and so fairly. There's two trustee areas that are contiguous to the Meta Barbara Junior High. Thank you. The next speaker is Roseanne Crawford. Roseanne Crawford here. I would like to thank Cooperative Strat Strategies Consultant for their excellent work. Our district is unusually complicated with both elementary and secondary education under one district. The shared governance of seven trustee areas over five is clearly best for improved governance because it allows for more representation and collective decision making. Scenarios four and six encourage continuity of communities, which is key to supporting neighborhood schools and engagement of community, not supportive of neighborhood schools or engagement, and is a huge factor not reflected and is impossible to compensate for in population demographics is the busing of hundreds of East Side students out of their neighborhoods into Monroe, Adams, Peabody, and Roosevelt schools, and how this distorts balancing efforts. The key difference with scenario six is the Santa Barbara High School's representation would include Montecito voters instead of only East Side voters, and the numbers are still balanced. Because Montecito is a theater for Santa Barbara High School, this is a plus. Our district needs more representation, not less. Our district needs to respect neighborhood boundaries and support neighborhood schools. With seven trustees, there would be better representation of communities through the shared representation and the governess would remain unchanged. There's never been a more important time to support neighborhood schools with the Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Eder. Eder, can you please state your full name? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Please state your full oh. name. Hi, everybody. My name is Eder Gaona. I'm a resident of the city of Santa Barbara, a product of the school district. Um, the California Voting Rights Act was created essentially for fair representation. The way that the maps are currently drawn do not provide fair representation for protected classes, including low income, 
families in the in the district. When looking at all maps, I saw that um, the west side where I grew up was being coupled with the Mesa. I, as resident, uh, do not believe that I have the same values as folks on the as on, on the Mesa, but I also believe the families don't. In order for us to create better maps, I do believe that we need to combine the west side, the east side, to have fair representation and have an additional district in Ivy and Old Town Goleta so that uh, protected families, protected classes get fair representation. In terms of um, considerations, although I agree that schools are important, uh, schools do not have a boat, uh, people do. So in looking at your at maps, I would really greatly uh, ask the board to consider uh, five districts and making sure that low income Latino families also have a fair uh, representation um, through the district processing. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Lay Tep. Uh, hi, board members. Uh, my name is Lay, and I work with SBS US. I mean, SBUSD Youth through Future Leaders of America. I'm here today to voice my concern in regarding uh, the redistricting maps currently being considered by the board. As presently constructed, none of the maps offer fair representation to the Latinx community. The Latinx community makes up almost 60% of the student body, but their voices as a protected class will be suppressed by the current maps. Based on the five scenarios publicly available, a total of only one district in only one scenario has a majority minority district. That is the opposite of fair representation. Don't approve a map that doesn't allow for Latinx representation. The community with the most kids should have proper representation. In most of the maps, low income neighborhoods are combined with affluent neighborhoods that don't share common interests. Combining the West Side low income renter immigrant neighborhoods with the affluent Mesa neighborhood, which is multi-million dollar homes makes no sense. Additionally, the public should have the tools and the additional time to allow us to draw our own maps and submit them for consideration. This is a tool provided by many other districts and cities going through the redistricting process as well. Without the tools for the public to submit their own maps, the process is neither transparent nor fair. Please do not rush this process and allow for more community input. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Hector Flores Garcia. Good evening, do you hear me? Yes. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Hector Flores Garcia. I work closely with the Santa Barbara region as a youth organizer for Future Leaders of America, and I have lived in the area for over 20 years now. I'm here today to draw attention to the lack of representation based on the five redistricting scenarios publicly available. Most of the scenarios preclude the East Side, West Side, and Old Town Galita from having fair representation. In addition, most maps combine low-income neighborhoods with affluent neighborhoods that don't share common interests and have disparities in voting behavior that can be drowned, that can drown out low-income voices. While we understand the desire to divide districts by schools, that doesn't make any sense because the schools are not protected classes of people. In the scenario that we divide our districts this way, low-income mi uh, minority voices will be overlooked. We know that it is in the country's best interest that residents in every neighborhood and community share thoughts on what your supervised supervisorial uh, district should look like. Uh, therefore, we should have tools to allow us to draw our own maps to make it a more transparent process. We need to give the community an opportunity to participate. This would give us the opportunity to voice our opinion on how the map should be drawn. And please make sure that you allow more time and allocate more meetings for community input and do not rush a process needlessly. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Brian. Brian, can you please state your full name? Sure. Brian, can you hear us? Oh. There yes, you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Brian Campbell. I completely agree with the speakers tonight as far as that each district should be representative of their neighborhoods and their communities and their families. It's also very clear from the voices that we heard tonight that they feel the current board has failed them, which is something that I said, Nelrod said, when we ran for school board last time around, is this school board is failing our community, our children, especially our Hispanic community, with an average rate of about three out of 10 children who can perform at a proficient skill level. 
That is ridiculous. So please definitely draw up lines that represent the areas. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Alan Evenstein. Mr. Evenstein, can you unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, thank you. Members of the board, thank you for your service to our community. Uh, these are difficult times in education and in our society at large. As a past member of the Board of Education, I know how difficult it is to serve in the capacity that you now uh, find yourselves. The, um, I'm here to advocate in favor of seven districts, um, and I feel that uh, that will provide the best representation. Um, building on what some of the previous speakers have said, um, I think that seven districts will provide uh, the greatest chance of a uh, uh, Latino majority CVAP district. I think that's the crucial category. Um, some of the other plans that would have, uh, particularly uh, in the uh, UCSB Isla Vista area, um, a largely Asian district. I've got, I'm totally supportive of uh, Asian representation, but at the same time, um, I think that from the California Voting Rights Act perspective, uh, the crucial issue is to create a Latino CVAP district. Only seven districts do, does that. I believe that of the plans before you, uh, district uh, plan four, scenario two would be the best. And I think there are many advantages to seven districts for candidates to run for the school board and to serve on the school board. Um, I think seven members will be more effective than five. Thank you for your time. Thank you. President, before that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you very much. And now uh, it is uh, time for the board to ask questions or give comments or possibly even share uh, their preferences. I'll turn to Ms. Munoz. Yes, thank you for presenting the, um, the district maps after the community meeting. Um, I have appreciated them. And at this point, I would be, I think I'm, you know, primarily interested in, in what other board members' uh, perspectives have, including our, our student board member. Thanks very much. Ms. sims Moton. Yes, thank you for the presentation tonight. I have a couple questions. Um, number one, uh, speaking to or trying to address, do we have tools for uh, members of the community to draw maps of their own and submit? We did not purchase a package that had those tools, but we can add them if the board wishes us to do so. I think that's something that I, that's heard just to give that opportunity, uh, just based on the comments tonight. And I know that I, I, I'm thinking this last meeting was probably the most attended. So maybe that's where that, that's coming in. So I, that would be one of my purposes if we could do that. So, but again, it has to be, a, I don't know if we can actually take action on that. But no. We can. Okay, but so can we give direction? in terms of looking at that. I don't know how do we discuss it and move it forward, so. I think we should ask uh, Scott to, to look at the possibility of providing that, yes. Okay, thank you. And then with regards to um, the protected classes um, that uh, some of the members have spoke about, is that addressed on um, the second? Um, I'm trying to think where that's that where where that's addressed in these um, scenarios. It could be any one of them. Just wondering if those questions about protected classes is that answered somewhere or addressed somewhere in, in one of these slides. Just to clarify, um, are you looking are you looking for a um, definition or how it's represented in? in the data yeah how it's represented in the data and if it's represented in the data with regards to protected class which is we've had several speakers speak to tonight sure and so um essentially what the maps try to do and that's um you know the second requirement which is drawn to comply with section two of the federal voting rights act um and basically what that means is um, drawing it in a manner that 
uh, would not impair the ability of a protected class to elect candidates of its choice or the ability to influence an outcome of the election. And so um, when looking at the, the gray columns on all of the data, and then you look at the CVAP column in this case of the Hispanic Latino population, um, you know, one of the things that we would try to do uh, if, if you could without um, looking, without creating things that could constitute gerrymandering or stacking packing, um, how you can shift lines around that still meet number one, which is uh, equal uh, number of inhabitants, how you can uh, bump up or at least have um, equal representation amongst all of the trustee areas for your protected classes. And so when looking at the demographic spread, which I said uh, in general for the citizen voting age population of the district at 22.2%, um, trying to at least have that level of representation within each, each voting area. If you look at number seven, for example, with some of the considerations that were discussed um, by the public, you do have trust area number two, which um, is the closest you can get to a minority majority. Um, it's still not a, a near majority, but you do have 42% representation there. Uh, but as, as I said at the same token, um, number one is lower than some of the other scenarios at 11%. But um, you know, the other, I guess, consideration that was said was, again, how that represents communities of interest too. And so that's how the data is represented in there for that requirement. Okay, I think I understood some of that. I'm sure I'll, my knowledge will increase as we go forward. So thank you for that. I might come back and ask for further clarification. And my final question, just and this is just for my understanding in the the column that's speaking to citizens voting age population, how is that relative to drawing the maps? Why is that so important? That is identifying, um, again, number two for the consideration, um, the legal consideration, that's identifying your protected classes um, based on section two of the Federal Voting Rights Act. So that's identifying the protected classes that, and I just need clarification because I'm, I'm lost here with regards to that. So um, so that, that particular data is identifying the protected classes of exactly of uh, essentially folks who can vote. So your citizen voting age population. So the way it, it breaks it down is um, you need to look at those that are of voting age, which uh, in some scenarios you can imagine there might be uh, concentrations of families that maybe have more school aged kids. And so if you were to look at total population that the percentages might be different than what a citizen voting age uh, percentage is. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Ms. Munoz. Yes. Oh, by the way, board members, if you could speak up also, I think we have some members of the public that are having trouble hearing us. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. I know one of the scenarios that I looked at was uh, scenario five. And I had a question about that one on the part where on the chart where it says population 18 and over the 2020 census. I don't know if um, on on that one, the population 18 and over on trustee area five, when you go down to Hispanic Latino, it says 0% there. And I didn't know if, if that's accurate. Um, scenario number five, you said? Correct. Uh-huh. Um, I've got 23% uh, represented in that one, at least on the slide I'm looking at. Right, on the on <clears throat> the 23% is on the citizens by voting age population estimate, mm -hmm. but the one that has the population 18 and over, the one right before that. Um, 
do you apologize? I guess I need some wayfinding here because I'm not seeing exactly what you're looking at. Uh, no, it's, let's see. Get. I'm looking at the attachment to, <clears throat> on the board docs, the scenario five. Uh, oh. It's got to be a typo. It, it says 0% um, a population over 18. Hispanic Latino. Let me see. I could look, let's see here. It's the middle table. Right, right. The one that. There's the one right under that, though. Yes, the, the population right there, uh, um, population 18 and over. See how the trustee area five zero percent. Yeah, that must be a type one. I apologize for that. It it um, should be 20. 23%, which we have on the presentation, which, um, so I apologize, that handout there is not reconciled the presentation, but it should be 23%. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Caps. Thank you. Um, so I want to, um, I, I'm concerned about some speakers comments tonight about uh, protected classes and I sure want to hear more and certainly give time so I, I support um, the need to allow for the maps to be dr drawn by the public uh, that's uh, been the gist of my comments uh, in the past few meetings is you know this came from the public um, wonderfully not by lawsuit but by um, but by you know the stakeholder uh, in advocacy and um, I'm sorry about that. My my dog is weighing in here. Um, but we haven't yet really heard maps from the public. Thank thankfully, 50 people showed up at the last meeting. But the um, but the you know prior to that, the public input has been very light, and it makes that just makes me uncomfortable going into a decision next board meeting. And so I just want to flag that I do think it's important to hear. And I we, we asked that um, President Ford and I had a meeting with um, three of the stakeholders who brought this forward to us last week and said, let's what what do you want these to look like? And now we're hearing from future leaders of America. And that's my same question. Please tell us, please draw the maps, please be more specific, flag what you can uh, work with our consultant, work with us. And I do think the ability as our county has had and as other um, bodies of governance have had where citizens can actually, people can actually get together and draw the maps is really missing from this process. So I flag that as a big, a big concern. Um, more specific concerns I have is that um, I understand Scott, you've done an amazing diligence here and have, have really tried to balance um, the need for um, representatives who represent both elementary schools and secondary schools. I do see that as a as a priority with obviously the whole um, crux of what we're doing this for, which is to protect, uh, to, to support um, the rights of, of protected classes and, and give them a voice on in our schools. But there are ways you can't just sort of say, oh, it can't be done uh, in Eureka and other places throughout the state where we have a unified school district like we do here, um, they have what is called hybrid maps which is non-contiguous, which is a question I've been asking the last couple meetings, is that possible? And I'm looking at one on my screen of Eureka where there's pockets that are not contiguous that allow for more balanced representation. So again, I just, my overarching comment is I think that we need to, to add more to the mix here to make sure this is as thoughtful and fair and representative a process as possibly can so that we achieve the outcome that I know we're committed towards all of us, um, but we can't, um, we can't do that without real community input 
And I urge us to look for ways to do that. And it might be looking at a hybrid scenario map. Again, there are perfect examples. And I don't know if Craig Price wants to speak to it, but it's it's allowed um, for districts like ours that have a combination of a previously elementary district with a secondary district to, to ensure more balance and more re representation, both of populations, but also of locale of where, where students are, where, where people who are connected to their schools vote. So I just kind of open that up to see if that's possible at this stage for those two um, developments, one to have the uh, stakeholders and, and interested members of the community draw maps, be more specific in their guidance, and also to uh, the addition of hybrid maps. Thank you, Ms. Caps. And Mr. Kelly, do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, I would just like to echo the community submission of maps. I think that's a really good idea. Um, and I'm glad that members of the public brought that to our attention. Uh, I think it's really important to get all stakeholders, all people affected by this uh, in these meetings where they are giving input and drawing exactly what they want. Um, I, I would say if I had to choose between five or seven trustee areas, I'd probably prefer seven just because I think it, we could be more equitable and equal uh, in terms of different people groups that are being rep represented. Um, obviously, it can't be perfect, but if we're thinking like people, I mean, sp especially in Santa Barbara, when there's really rich people and really poor people living pretty close to each other, I think with seven trustee areas, it's less likely that these people are misrepresented because there are smaller areas and um, more people being represented. I think that's important. Thank you very much. I'll just add uh, that I agree with my uh, colleagues that we should try to make it possible for the communities of interest to have as much influence as possible. At this time, I am very interested in moving forward, so we have work to do in order to be ready for the 2022 election. And I am in favor of the seven trustee areas also, I think, at this point, just because the population size of the area is reduced and it does allow, can allow, for more communities of interest. So um, I'd like to ask Scott that you consider ways that perhaps even if people are not drawing the map, that people, that you're responding to the, the comments that have been made and the concerns that have been made so that uh, we truly believe that this is a community effort. And I thank you for that and I hope some folks will be able to attend Thursday's meeting. <laughs> Any final comments or Mr. Price, would you like to speak? Ms. Sims Moton. Yeah, I think so as we're looking at the five and seven, so would, let's say if seven is the, the choice that we make, do we change our charter? Charter Would that delay us getting to those district trustee areas? Because we've been maybe chartered to be five as opposed to seven. Just wondering what that process is about. Just one second, Mr. Price, your mic doesn't seem to be on. Thank you. No, uh, make an, al an alteration that would take you from five to seven would not alter the process, just the breakdown. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Price or Mr. Newell? Seeing none, I will close this hearing and we will adjourn to a much needed 10 minute break. Please put the timer on. And we are now moving on to the action agenda of our meeting tonight. And the first item is consideration for G1. This is to approve the 2021-22 Santa Barbara Unified School District School Plans for Student Achievement. I will turn this meeting over to Mr. Benz. Thank you very much, President Ford. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Maldonado. Um, it's my pleasure to bring to you um, our, this is actually our, this school year's SIPSAs. So if you just remember, the process normally happens during the spring, during budgeting, uh, 
but because of our certain our specific situation, the state has actually allowed us flexibility to do this, so we're doing it during this time. Uh, so a couple things to keep in mind that each SIPSA, which is our single plan of student achievement, so each school has reviewed it with their ELAC and also received recommendation, as well as the school site council voting and approving it so it's aligned with federal law with every student succeeds act so um, which is important the plan does include title one budgets which is necessary because that is the federal funding that schools are receiving as well as um, all schools are actually as you saw all schools are submitting their plans except for la cuesta la cuesta will be submitting theirs in december Another thing to keep in mind is um, La Colina Junior High School is not a Title I school. Um, and one thing that I was impressed with is that they are also submitting a plan. They're using the single plan to guide the instruction that's happening at the school. They're not required by law to have a single plan, but they are, they are doing it and submitting it. So you won't see a Title I budget attached to it. That's particularly important. One last specific thing is Dos Pueblos High School. Um, Dos Pueblos is shifting from targeted assistance to school-wide. The, uh, the, the threshold is 40%, so you have to have 40% or over in terms of socioeconomically disadvantaged students at the school. Uh, in 2019 and 20, they were at 35%. Last school year, they were at 39.8%. So, um, and this year, they're over the threshold. So it's, it's no surprise considering the impact of the pandemic on families in terms of economic situation. So that's not surprising. So when you vote for Dos Pueblos, you'll actually be voting for a school-wide plan. That will be the shift. And that, that is doable under the law um, and then the last thing i just want to bring to your attention is that in spring we will be bringing to you the 22-23 next year's single plans uh, and that will also include budgeting so we're, we'll start in the spring the normal process we'll go back to the the normal expectations regarding sipsis so that's my report to you any questions uh, thank you so much. I have one question before we go to public comment. Will you be overseeing the implementation of the plans? Or who on the cabinet or within the educational services does that? So the responsibility of that, it actually is the, it will be um, the assistant superintendent. So the assistant superintendent of elementary and the assistant superintendent of secondary. And the responsibility of implementation actually falls on the, on the shoulders of the principal in terms of at the school site. So that's, that's the alignment to that. Thank you very much. Ms. Trujillo, do we have any public comments on this item? Thank you, President, for we do have public comment on this um, item. And I will name the speakers, Sharon Jagodka, Alice Post, and Moni Duet. I will start with Sharon Jagodka. Chikotka, one moment, lower her hand. Okay, we'll go with Moni DeWitt. Hi there, thanks again, Sandra and board. I appreciate getting to talk to you about this because this is extremely important. And I was also on the LCAP advisory board and many parents there spoke out and were not happy about the literacy model. When I looked at these individual plans, the big concern is again, you're using balanced literacy and other programs, but what, what is science-based and evidence-based and subtle science is the science of reading. And so um, we can tell, and even future leaders of America, I know Laura, that you are always open to their suggestions and they're on the same, they're saying the exact same things. If you look at the A through Gs, only 6% of our English language learners or multilingual learners, any way you want to name it, they uh, get to apply to UCs. Their, their diploma is not the same as their white and Asian peers. 
and those students with learning differences, the same thing. Only 6% of them get to apply to the UCs. And so what I'm trying to point out is they're failed at the end of the system, these big vulnerable groups. And they're also failed when you look at the fourth graders and you look at the subgroups with socioeconomic hardship, like at Cleveland and Adelante. They're in the like the teens and the 20 percentiles. This is unacceptable. So we have to follow the science of reading. And I really beg the board to show leadership because the superintendent, the administration has been locked in these stagnant scores for decades. And we need to turn this around. It's about equity and right. being fair. That's why our town has disparity. And President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. You had previously named three people. I think they were by mistake, they lowered their hand. Okay, thank you so much. Board members, I will turn to you for comments and questions. Ms. Alvarez, please. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you to all the principals for all this work on top of everything else that they're doing. So thank you for all that. And um, just as a point of comparison, Mr. Vance, I don't know if you know this, has our Title I funded fluctuated between last year and this and this plan, are we getting about the same? Are we getting less? Um, do we do we know? I, I actually don't know the answer to okay. that question. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moton, please. Uh, yes, and this may be I may be confused on size, but it's always really interesting to hear from the principals. You know, to really talk to speak to it on a personal. Thing. Will we kind of get back to that, even if? I mean, you know, we're coming back in 22, 23, and not necessarily here in person, but it's always really good to be able to hear from them directly. So not, you know, just reading into the summaries are really good. So I appreciate that in the light of what we have to do. But I always just really appreciate it um, that um, personal com contact, we, you know, in this case, it may be Zoom. But if we could just kind of get back to that, I really hear, I really appreciate hearing from them. I And that was brought up, actually. So in pre-pandemic there yeah. was you did the circles and right. then they they talked about it so we can actually look at it during the spring I, the idea could be doing it we could do it outside we could do it in a way that's safe and also have that opportunity to allow you to ask questions and so on so sure so and also appreciate the work it took to get this together to everyone that was involved thank you miss caps or miss munoz do you have any comments yeah, I'd just like to echo that I would love to have that chance in the spring to be able to dive in on these SIPSAs. And I think we should say the acronym out, uh, Mr. Vance, if you don't mind, uh, for the public, but because I'm, I'm not remembering it right this moment, uh, but it's a nice way for um, to bring, bring these important reports to life. So if you could spell the acronym and then make a note for the spring, I'd appreciate it. Yes, it's the Single Plan <laughs> Student Achievement, SIPSA. So, and this is due, known as single plans, and due to the state at, on an annual basis, correct? Yes. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mr. Kelly, do you have any comments? No comments at this time. Thank okay, you for your thanks. report. I, I too echo the need to, uh, to interact personally with the principals about this, uh, having done SIPSAs myself, I, I know how hard it is, I know how time consuming it is, but in the end it is very rewarding to, to see how um, compiling all of the needs and the uh, feedback uh, lead one's school to having a, a true plan. And the best thing about it is to be able to continually refer to it, stick to it, and and implement it so i appreciate the summary that you gave us and i look forward to to really talking with principals again and i think whether it's on zoom or not that we can find a way either with breakout rooms or whatever i think uh, we will all really benefit from that interaction with the principals sounds good so thank you very much um, with that i would like to call for a motion to accept these single plans for student achievement for the schools so moved. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moton. And a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 These plans are approved. Thank you very much, Mr. Venz. That takes us to item number two, action item number two, which is the adoption of the resolution put forward by our school board. Uh, 
for the 2021-22-10 resolution of the Santa Barbara Unified School District ensuring expanded access to rigorous learning for all students. I wonder if we could put it up please on the screen. I just want to point out and remind the board that it's very comprehensive and basically restates all of the really important reasons, which is what the whereas statements are, the reasons why we need to really take action on this item. So you see we have one, two, three, four, please continue scrolling. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 9, continue please. <laughs> on to uh, probably a dozen whereas, and I'd like to, if you could make it a little bit bigger, I'd like to read aloud the resolution itself. And not the whole resolution, the ending, therefore. A little bigger, thank you. Therefore, it is hereby resolved that the Santa Barbara Unified School District Board of Education directs the superintendent and her staff to develop a multi-year plan to address inequitable access to rigorous learning for all students. This phased plan should include stakeholder input, additional categories for identifying students as gifted, implemented, uh, implementation for a cohesive gate cluster model at all sites with professional development or learning for teachers, integrated access to honors level coursework and credit, and professional learning of differentiated instruction. And with that statement of the resolution, I would like to open this to public comment. Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this resolution? Yes, we have public comment on this item. Please. Shannon Schroeder, Allison Quijano, Caroline Hera, and I will begin with Shannon Schroeder. Hi, thank you. Um, good evening, board members and members of the administration. Uh, I wholly support this idea. It seems fairly clear cut that all students should have the opportunity to take part in challenging and stimulating learning experiences. I guess I'm most interested in how the stakeholders will be involved in this process and how parents will be made aware of the steps that the administration is taking to expand access to these programs. Before we consider maybe doing away with the gate magnet class, we must first have a plan in place. If the district continues to administer the gate test, there's the inherent assumption that the gate magnet program or other equal alternative will be available. I think this resolution would be better served if it held the administration to task. We need more than just professional learning on differentiated instruction. We need curriculum specialists or paraeducators in every classroom. We need a reading and math specialist at every school, not just one for the district. We need more staff, more training, including gate certification for all teachers, smaller class sizes, and we need to identify and address learning deficits early on. We need multi-tiered systems of support ready to address these needs immediately. As it stands, we are already experiencing massive learning loss across grade levels, only exacerbated by the board's decision to keep schools closed for a year. Teachers are doing their very best to address their students' needs despite increasing demands. How can teachers be expected to teach to children far below grade level and far above grade level without the extra help, training, or extra services. We keep putting more and more on teachers without offering resources. I truly support this resolution. Thank you. Next speaker is Allison Quijano. Good evening, board members. Thank you. My name is Allison Quijano, and I'm the instructional support specialist for secondary English teachers for the district. I'm speaking in support of the proposed resolution ensuring expanded access to rigorous learning for all students. I'm in favor of this resolution for a number of reasons, but first among these is the work that some of our high school English teachers have been piloting this year. Though ensuring all students have access to rigorous grade level or above content and skills is difficult work, the teachers I have been working alongside this year have demonstrated that it is possible. Not only is this possible, but it has the potential to be beneficial for all students in these heterogeneously grouped classes. This opportunity is not a zero sum game. I genuinely believe all students and teachers can benefit from the plan that may come as a result of this resolution. I ask the board to pass this resolution and once it's passed to ensure that we as a district develop and present a plan to achieve the goals of the resolution 
that adequately supports teachers with the time and resources they will need to be successful. Teachers will need adequate time to prepare for the transition and professional learning dedicated to scaffolding, differentiation, and extension for students who are ready. I hope to have the opportunity to share some of the work teachers and students have been doing, as well as some data we've gathered from our pilot with you sometime soon. Thank you so much for taking the time and thank you for all the work that you do uh, for our district. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next speaker is Caroline Harris. Hello. Hi. Oh, hi, sorry. Uh, I have a little bit of cold, so I'm sorry. Um, while I support the resolution in principle, I question the analysis and methods and therefore request a redraft that offers more relevant and specific actions that can be taken to truly ensure equity. Your resolution seems to focus primarily on GATE and its disproportionate impact on access to academic rigor and in turn future success. But it fails to acknowledge that a relatively few students of any ethnicity actually participate in GATE in Santa Barbara and without any long-term negative impact. GATE is not an absolute determinant of success and the inability to participate in GATE is not a deterrent. Regarding honors coursework, there are no barriers to a student participating in these classes in junior or senior high. In fact, any student is able to register for honors courses without approval. My point, your resolution seems to miss the mark and won't solve the problem. In fact, the resolution as worded appears to be a veiled attempt to dismantle programs that are working exactly as intended. If you are indeed interested in equity, I request that you please focus on closing the achievement gap through early education, i.e. before GATE and thereafter, and literacy programs that keep students at or above grade level and ultimately pave the way for academic success no matter the pathway. Please resist the temptation to consolidate honors and CP courses. Include action items in your resolution that reinforce your commitment. Thank you. President Four, that concludes public comment on this item. Uh, thank you very much. And board members, before I call for this motion, I do want to uh, clarify that this is a resolution that is that states the board's intent. It does not include the plan. So my direction to educational services is that we recognize the importance of this um, opportunity and that as you create a plan, if we do pass this resolution, that it is a manageable timeline and a reasonable timeline. Teachers are very busy. Teachers are tired. Uh, we also will demand that there are resources in the plan that are robust and innovative and that there is engagement of all stakeholders in every element of the plan that follows this resolution. So with those uh, caveats in mind, board members may I have a motion to approve this action item, the adoption of resolution 2021-22-10 of the SB Unified School District, ensuring expanded access to rigorous learning for all students. Do we need to take the motion first before we discuss? Yes. I. Don't think I gave you an opportunity to discuss. <laughs> I I'm thought so it was sorry. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, yeah. Please, comments or questions first. I really like the resolution, I, I guess. I guess you goes do. without saying. Okay. There yes. we go. Okay. Thank you. Please <laughs> for sharing Ms. it. Smoten. Yes, so thank you. Uh, and I, in theory, I am um, in support of this and that this is tagging on to the presentation that was made last board meeting uh, with uh, Ms. Carey and Ms. Acevedo, right? Right, okay, I was trying to make the connection there. I, I am concerned about what extra this intent or direction from the board will be um, imposing, if you will, on the teachers, on the staff that are already just overloaded we've heard it we see it and so I just want to recognize is this the time or is there something we need to put in here that it's not effective right away that if we phase it in um, and then also to the point of some of the comments from some of the um, the two speakers that spoke about uh, adding some different language in in this but I I'm less inclined to support it just because it's concerning about adding additional work on the plates of teachers. I get the intent and I know we've been working toward trying to get more equity, particularly in our gate classes um, that we're doing, uh, but I'm concerned 
um, deeply about adding more. And this is going to add quite a bit, you know, in terms of being able to do this. Um, and so I also want to look at, you know, how would we have the resources um, to make sure that this happens, um, you know, in a, in a way that, again, it does not impose extra work on you as admin staff and as, as teachers to, to do that. So that's my comment. Yes. Absolutely. Sure. Ms. Carey and Ms. Escobedo, please. Thank you. I'll take um, I'll take the first path at, pass at responding to that, and and just say that I think I speak for Ms. Escobedo my, and and myself when I say that that is also something that we're very mindful of, um, uh, particularly with a lot of the reminders we've had tonight. Um, I want to make sure that we are. I, I want to make sure I understand parts of your question and clarify a couple parts about you talked about the gate classes in um, secondary. We don't we don't have gate classes. I'll, I'll let Ms. Escobedo speak to that. Um, I do want to flesh out a little bit something you heard from public comment, um, which is the fact that this has been piloted already um, fairly robustly in our high schools, uh, specifically in ninth grade, um, but also to some extent in 10th grade. So it's, it's in a pilot phase now, um, but we've not made structural changes that are the, of the type that the resolution points to um, because that is pending exactly coming back to you with a plan that does demonstrate this thoughtful, phased, supported, um, and well-timed implementation of any structural changes. Um, so until we have the chance with your direction and pending the passing of this resolution to formulate that plan, um, I'll, I'll refrain from any details because they would be preliminary at this point, but I do want to at least represent that there has been a robust pilot underway. And so how is the pilot going? Because I don't know that we've heard that it was going on. So. It's very successful pilot so far. Um, that we can bring you that, that preliminary data as part of the report. Yeah, I think that's, that's really important because, you know, we want to want to be responsive because oftentimes we're giving direction as a board but not necessarily understanding the ripple effect of what we're saying. All intent is good. Um, so I, I would love to see that data to see the pilot is going on. We've done this. We've addressed some of the issues that we've talked about. And the reason I talked about GATE because GATE was in here, not necessarily linking it to the two. So I, I appreciate that part of it. Yeah, I, I, am, I do want to know how the pilot is going um, before I'm ready to support this at this point. We'll bring that in December. Uh, Ms. Carey, so to clarify, you will bring uh, some data back to us in December. And when do you anticipate a plan uh, that you would I, at least share with the board? I think we can share that preliminary plan in December and have it be inclusive of the data that you're seeking. Thank you. Ms. Alvarez. Thank you. Uh, I do have several questions. I guess I'm a little bit unclear about the order of operation. At the last board meeting, you presented a great report with data. There were some questions that I had and I think other board members. So to me, that was the next step. So honestly, I was extremely surprised that there's a resolution being brought forward today without that step that to me was the logical step. And I went back and looked at my notes because I know it was late, I was tired. <laughs> And I was waiting for that. I, I have several concerns about this resolution, honestly. I've heard concerns from teachers that they feel this is going to increase more work on top of everything else that they already are doing. I'm also concerned about district admin and the workload that you have. Of course, I personally support the principle of <laughs> having access to everything. I mean, that's, that's a given. I feel that this is too rushed. I feel that I personally need more discussion. I need to understand it better. I also need to understand exactly what it is that we, that the result is going to be from this resolution. If you, if you mentioned that you were ready to bring a draft of the plan in December, I would much rather see the components of what you're thinking about that plan than this is a lot of information that I want to understand better. I also want to know what teacher input we have. 
Uh, the teachers are the ones in the classroom. They're the ones with the impact. I like to know what do they think about this. I also want to take a step back and talk to Dr. Maldonado about her workload and the, the workload that you have and the impact on the teachers before we're adding one more layer. So that's where I'm at. Thank you. Ms. Munoz, do you have any comments? I think that, you know, the concerns are valid in terms of um, the workload and, and what it would involve. Um, I would like to know more about, like, the pilot and how that's going um, also before we take a, a vote. Thank you. Ms. Caps. do you have any comments? Yeah, first about the process, I believe this resolution was intended to uh, basically give direction, sanction the report and the work. So I know there, I can understand the, the questions from my board, fellow board members of, of timing, but that was my understanding is that we, we last meeting, we heard these very alarming statistics about disproportionality of um, students of color in our gate and um, honors courses. And now the board is affirming with this, this action tonight our values of wanting to work on that, wanting the staff to work and come back with a report, which would include a timeline, which would include stakeholder feedback involving teachers, et cetera. So that's my understanding of the sequence and I'm comfortable with that if, if others are as well and certainly support the values of this. Um, speaking to the timing, I agree. I feel the urgency. I've long felt the urgency about trying to um, provide more opportunity for gifted and talented services on campuses for all students, um, not just those who can get transportation over to a magnet school in the elementary or um, have been on the right path uh, for secondary. So I feel this, I'm caught because I feel, um, you know, I know this is something we, we wanted to take up before we were struck by a pandemic. Um, and so now we are, but I also very loud and clear here from teachers how much, um, how many new initiatives they are shouldering on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. And so with that, I just um, am in full support of this resolution with the um, shared direction of my colleagues that we take this methodically. And really this comes from teachers, it comes from parent involvement too, but really the teachers in the classroom who are actually providing these um, services for enhanced and rigorous learning. So I, I support the resolution. I can make the motion if that's the time for it at this point. Um, but with that, that caveat and that understanding of real need for um, not moving quickly, but rather with the, with the full support and input and um, collaboration of our teachers and staff. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I would like to ask Ms. Carey and Ms. Escobedo if you could share your understanding what the resolution is, because I believe at the last meeting that we did say that the next step would be the board taking a stand. And I feel like that's what this resolution does, is it says this is what we believe, and now we ask you to come up with uh, a plan that is reasonable and manageable and that teachers understand and are part of the stake uh, stakeholder feedback process. So I wonder if you could each speak to that. Um, I agree with Ms. Caps that this is uh, urgent for us to take a stand and that the timeline uh, that you come up with is only going to be approved or not from, by us. I'll just yeah, briefly respond by saying that, that that's been my understanding as well. Um, and I don't want to minimize the complexity or, or the real work involved in the kinds of shifts we're talking about um, exploring, planning for, and ultimately executing. Um, again, we haven't developed that plan because that would be out of order, um, but we do have some preliminary thinking and we have had some successful piloting. And I think if we can be sharing, sharing that with you at the next meeting, you can be you know, giving your, your advisement and direction to us about things like uh, pace or workload, and, and we can you know, bring you some glimpses too of some preliminary stakeholder input. Thank you. Ms. Escobedo? Yeah, absolutely the same uh, for me. That was my understanding. I feel like it was very clear at the end of our presentation um, and th that the data 
had uh, spoken for itself over something that had been known for quite some time. At the end of the board meeting, we talked about very specifically these concerns and we all are in agreement that the priorities for moving forward, if we move forward, um, would be to make sure that we have stakeholder en engagement and input and uh, that it is a um, over time thoughtful process uh, that is inclusive of really good research and 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 um, examples that we may include in our thinking um, maybe not calling it a plan uh, maybe that is the premature word maybe uh, calling it our suggestions our ideas in moving forward um, as we go through that stakeholder engagement process to fully develop a plan thanks dr maldonado would you like to make any comments Yes, thank you. So I want to thank uh, Ms. Carey and Ms. Escobedo, and I, I hear the concerns of some of the board members in terms of the process and some of the workload. I do believe that part of our equity agenda is to be open and transparent about what we see happening in the system and the things that we need to consider putting in place as a district that intervenes in the places where we need transformation. And you'll hear more about it in the next report because this is part of the work we're doing with multi-tiered systems of support. I fully support this resolution so that we can get uh, down to the work. I understand some of the teachers' concerns, but I also feel that, and I've heard from many, that they personally also see the inequities in their classrooms. They have come to me and explained to me that they would like to see us lead in this space. Uh, and I'm not speaking for all, I'm just speaking for some who have also challenged us to think about what can we do differently so that we can address what we have known to be true, which is access to some, but not all. And for those reasons, I, I support it. Thank you. Board members, further questions or comments? Yes, I do have more questions and comments. Thank you. Sure. Uh, like I said, I, I feel this is rushed. I do not I haven't seen the teacher input so if you have it to share with us I'm all ears um, I, I do understand that this is the direction for you to make the plan I get that I also think that there's more discussion to be had I also believe and I hope I'm right <laughs> that this like you said there's work that's already taking place I hear teachers very loud and clear that they need more input and that they have a huge huge workload right now and this resolution brought when they read it they were extremely nervous because they didn't really understand what it meant for them I if uh, the both of you said that it was that last week the data was presented I mean last month yes the data was presented I did request I did have some specific request I don't know when that information is going to be coming forward so if that was if it was if I missed a point that you made then that's okay I can relearn that I do want to know when you'll be bringing that data that I requested because that's going to help me make a decision of course i'm all for equity i mean i i'm part of that population that we talk about all the time i am i want to make a difference but i'm also i also want to be very mindful of what we are putting on the teachers plates thank you thank you Ms. sims moton yeah and i must be complete, completely foggy because i didn't get those in i'm sure it was there because i probably go back and look at the meetings so i'm gonna own that part <laughs> I will be the user area on that part. I just, I just think that, again, I, I am in theory am in support of it, so I don't want that to be implied that I'm not. But I, I do think that what often is not unspoken is the when the board gives direction, such as we're doing here, that's work. It's done. It's done. We've got to do it. 
<laughs> on top of everything else that we're doing. So that's my biggest concern that as a board, when we're making this, again, the ripple effect that may be silent, not here, but maybe come out in other areas, you know. Um, and so I, I just want to be us to be mindful of that. I mean, that's that's my whole thing. I really am, am mindful of the level of work that you're having and you're being asked to do. I get it. Um, it's part of work that we've been trying to do. But given all that we've gone through in this year, can we just take a pause for a moment? Uh, just take a step back. If this resolution doesn't go through, what harm is going to come in waiting a little bit? That, I think that's what I'm saying, perhaps even what Board Member Alvarez is saying. What, what harm is that? You know, will it do some undue harm if we take a step back, um, you know, to just, you know, to give, take that breath with regards to what we're doing? There's an awful lot that you're doing here, and I'm concerned that it's going to be on top of somebody, something else. And folks that who aren't vocal, um, it comes out in other ways. And so that, that's my concern with that, not with the resolution itself, but what it implies and what, it in, what the intent is with regards to implementing and the action that's going to be taken or expect to be taken. I would only just add that it does, the resolution does say it is to develop a multi-year plan. So this is not something that happens overnight. It is not something that just is forced down people's throats. It is a multi-year plan to address inequitable access to rigorous learning for students. I'm with you there, President um, Ford, and I, but I, I really want to emphasize again how important it is in terms of what we're saying here is that there's an expectation that this is going to get done, it may feel like it's being rammed down the throat. It may seem like that because when we're caught, we're giving direction and action, it, it supersedes everything else that you're doing and it are, are on top of everything that you're doing. So that's what I'm saying. I'm not disagreeing with this, this at all. I'm just saying what harm will be done if we take a step back before we go into this. Sure. Dr. Maldonado. So I, I hear the um, hesitancy of feeling that this is going to be one more initiative. If the, if the board members, after your deliberation, wish to have us slow down and take a step back, I do want to address that, uh, what Anna said earlier with the regards to it being a plan. In order for us to get there, we have to do the teacher input. We have to go out and seek their guide, their thoughts because we're, op we're addressing the problem so that we can, we're naming the problem so that we can go out and figure out how to fix it. If it feels at this point that the resolution is written in such a way that we're gonna go out and do something to somebody instead of with somebody, I think that we, I wanna clarify that that is not at all the intention. Uh, do, we don't also have to do it this year, but we can prepare for you some of the ways that we think we can do this thoughtfully by seeking the right input in the right time with us having a chance to hear from everyone. I understand the feelings that I'm hearing around uh, the everybody's plates are overloaded and the stress that we are all feeling. Personally, I think for children who do not get an adequate education, they have lifelong consequences that are a result of not getting an appropriate education. So for me, that is the sense of urgency that I feel around having us really go out and talk to people about this issue, bringing back to you data, bringing back to you what we're hearing, what we're learning over time. If it feels that instead of having a resolution, and you want us to keep doing this work, bringing back some of the results of the pilot, bringing back after we hear from people what are they thinking about some of these things, we can do it that way too. There's not a one that's like not one size fits all answer. But I, I do feel a personal responsibility knowing family members and others who have not had access to higher education and what happens when we have systems of schooling where we don't create outcomes for everyone. And I think this is a, an attempt for us as leaders of the school district to really address that purpose of why we do the work we do and think about why we're doing it, why we're bringing it to you 
uh, as board members so that we're very open and transparent as a system in looking at some of the outcomes we know we have had historically that we, we, we brought to you in the past with our data. So we can do it either way, is what I'm saying, but I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that this work is important work and it's, and it's the kind of work that we are really called to do in a public education system. So, okay, let me just respond to, great. I understand fully the importance of this work. I understand fully if we don't do the things we do that kids who don't traditionally do, we don't do that. But that's not what I'm, my argument at all. I am not disagreeing to how the importance of it. I truly understand. You hear me always talking about early education, how important it is systematically that we do have a more equitable system that allows people to access it earlier and the fact that they can access it, right? So that's not my argument in one way, form or fashion tonight. My, my concern, as I have said, is that it feels like, even though hear from folks, what, what, what did you think when you saw this resolution? What did you feel? What did you think about that? So that gives you the opportunity to clear it up because this conversation, without this conversation, people will be thinking, oh, they just did that and I didn't get my input. But the fact that we're discussing it at this level, that allows access to what we're thinking and why we're doing it. It's even provided more clarity. So that's what I'm asking too, is take a step back to your second point. How do you do it that way? Still may come to this. It, yeah. it, bring it back at our next meeting. But take that one moment to be more clear and understanding. I think that goes a long way with people assuming what we're doing when we make a decision, as opposed to we're including, you know, we're taking the time to include their thoughts. And then you don't have people, you know, silently talking about a process that's going on. I don't, unless I'm seeing, I'm not hearing something about it doing undue harm if we wait just to get the last things that we're asking and to, to approach your second, you know, your second piece. Um, that's what I'm saying. I'm not arguing at all how critical it is because I know it, been part of it, understand it. So it's about take the time to make sure that people comprehensively understand what we're doing. And we need to have discussions like this so it's clear. And you don't get 60 emails because we weren't as clear as we needed to do. Take the time to be that, to have that clarity. So. And sure, Ms. Alvarez. I, I really think and I believe in my heart that teachers are working extremely hard, that kids are learning. I've seen it. Uh, last uh, week, about oh, two weeks ago, I forgot, I had a wonderful tour of the DP Engineering Academy and I saw kids learning, I saw happy students. Uh, this weekend I participated in, in reviving the La Colina garden. There were a lot of parents, a lot of students, and students are learning. So I believe that even without this resolution, I believe that teachers are working extremely hard. I believe that kids are learning, and I believe that admin's working very hard. And I also, want to do it right. I'm all for equity. Um, like I said before, nobody has to tell me. I live that. I know what it's like to sit in a classroom and not speak the language. I mean, I don't have to read it. I know that. And because I know that, I want to do it right. I don't want to rush into anything. I want us to talk about a plan, and that's the analytical part of me, I, I want to see the plan and I want to see the components of that plan. And I want to see, okay, how are teachers going to have input? How are we considering including our special ed population? Our different learning styles. And that's what I need. That's my learning style. That's the diversity that I bring to this board. And I'm sorry if uh, my comments are not popular. That's okay. Because, like I said, I want to do it right. And I want to make sure that we bring all the stakeholders at the table, that they have their chance to make comments, they have their chance to say whatever it is that they need to say. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah. Ms. Caps? I'm just trying to decipher this good conversation uh, so we get to a good outcome. So Ms. Alvarez, if 
if I, I if how do we, would you like to direct the staff to devise the plan short of this resolution? You just like to make that direction without passing a resolution? Is that because in my mind, this resolution does exactly what you say. It directs the staff to come up with a plan. But if you're feeling as though the it's the cart before the horse and Ms. Sims Moten seems to be reflecting that as well, how do we then, if we don't do this resolution, how does the staff then, is it they just take these comments as direction? Is that what you're intending? No. I'm just trying to understand. Thank, thank you for uh, asking. Um, I'm not, no, this is it. This is what I what I would like. I this resolution has a lot of information, and it, it's created a, many many questions for me. And I come to the board meetings. Granted, I miss things. So I'm not perfect. So it created a lot of alarm, and urgency, and fear in some teachers that we as a board are making decisions without their input and we're piling more work us uh, to them i mean we're already doing mtss we're doing new report cards we're doing many new initiatives that are that are good initiatives so i feel my responsibility as a board is to take a step back and do a self-evaluation and say okay what is it that we have directed the staff to do? And have we taken into consideration the impact? I mean, look, there, there, you have staff at the school sites who are doing COVID testing. That's in addition to the discipline. That's in addition to their lesson plans. That's in addition to the block schedule. I mean, I know what it's like. I work at a school and I want to be mindful of what additional work we're given to the staff. And to say, is this something that we need to do today? Or is this something that maybe we need to have a conversation? Maybe teachers need to give their input. So my, you ask, what's my direction to the staff today? My direction to the staff today is let's take a step back today. And for the next two weeks, think about your workload. Think about what you have so that we can finish at least this semester successfully. And what I would like to see, I would like to see that Dr. Maldonado goes and visits the schools because she has so much work to do that she may not be able to do that. That's what I would like to do. My direction is let's take a step back Let's look at this. Let's see exactly what it is that we're looking for and what's the outcome. And once we come up with that, then we can decide, do we need a resolution or we, do we need a plan without the resolution? That's my direction today. Let, let, let's take a step back and see what everything that we're doing and see how we can do it better because like I said, I wanna do it right. And I want to be aware also of what could be the unintended consequences. Thank and, and you. Ms. Munoz, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Ms. Munoz, please. Yes, I think that, you know, just in thinking about it and the discussion that we're having as a board, that it would be helpful to know what, you know, what the pilot, how that is going, get some, you know, discussion about that. Also, what training do the teachers, would they need? Um, and how do they feel about it? You know, is it um, overwhelming for them at this point? Um, as as my fellow board sisters said, you know, it is a lot for uh, for our teachers. You know, for our teachers and our administrators. And also, I'm just as you know um, concerned about the equity and our students uh, having. Uh, full access to uh, an education that 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 be um, equity based and so forth, but I think that you know more discussion, more teacher input would be helpful um, in order to do this in a thoughtful manner um, and come up with a plan. Thank you, and Ms. Sims Moten, please. Yeah, 
so so thank you i i really do appreciate um this conversation it's not easy conversations but i think it's a necessary conversation as to putting the cart before the horse no i don't think that i think it's really about just taking the step back that allows in this process input you know thinking about it um again from all the, all the things i don't need to repeat all the things that have been said here um it, it's 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 truly about you know making sure that we're looking looking through all of it, making it in a more balanced way of how we're giving direction, what we're doing in terms of um, how we go forward. And I think if nothing we learned through COVID is that we, we've got to do things a little bit differently. That includes how we bring things here. How, what are we adding to each other's plate? Um, you know, certainly you, you guys tell us what's urgent and we certainly can respond to that. So I, I'm just saying that this is not, I'm not saying that it's not important. It's just that can we take a step back? And is it really, does it come back in terms of the need for a resolution um, versus a plan, or maybe both. But I, if we just take that pause, because if you think about it, this, this, this level of discussion that's happening right now is not something that, 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 that's important. So, Thanks. I, w I was wondering if I could ask Ms. Uh, Carrie and Escobedo, if, uh, if we don't pass this resolution, how can you move forward? Um, I'm thinking you can. Um, and you alluded to it, Dr. Maldonado. So uh, there, I'm uh, anticipating that there is not support at this time for the resolution, but I believe there's support for the intent. And so I wonder, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know I am as to what you can do if we do not pass this resolution. I think we should all know that at least, and uh, then we can move forward. So I can, uh, what I'm hearing too is that uh, we presented data at the last board meeting, but I think um, there is information inclusive of data, but that is additive to data that we can also be bringing you about work to date and possible future work, either more immediately or more long term. And I think uh, maybe everyone would benefit from hearing more information uh, beyond just the quantitative data that we presented last month. Um, that that would help enrich the conversation, um, as well as uh, I'm really hearing this part about the different components uh, and considerations that need to be in play. Um, I did, we did hear your specific data requests. We have been sort of working on those. Some of them were somewhat granular, but they are important ones. So I do want to acknowledge and affirm that we heard those data requests, Board Member Alvarez. So I think those are things that we can do in a, in a moving forward kind of way, and that's, that that's a lot. Yes, thank you. Ms. Escobedo. Yeah, and I think um, we as teachers know how to multitask um, in a way that allows us to work smarter, not harder. So I think this is a really great opportunity to think about how can we work, continue to work towards this, this idea, knowing that we know better with the data that we, that we now have uh, presented and use the opportunities that are already in place um, to be able to start that input process. We have a, a lot of different opportunity uh, groups. Um, one that comes to mind is task force. Um, we have obviously our EPC, our elementary principals committee, and, and we could, you know, different teacher committees as well that we could start with and continue moving forward so that it can help inform these ideas and suggestions that could later on lead to a well, very cohesive, collaborative plan. Thank you. Dr. Maldonado, do you have anything you'd like to say now? No, I think uh, I hear the, the asks are varied, and I think uh, I have a lot of confidence in the cabinet and uh, the teachers and principals that we can continue to do the work and uh, we'll continue to report back. Thank you. Ms. Capps, I, I, my intent or my inclination is to table this motion and, uh, and to move forward with an understanding and an appreciation for all the points of view that have been expressed here by the board. I would like to ask my board members to um, do me one favor, and that is within maybe a couple days, two or three days, if you have more specific questions that you'd like to have answered by the educational services staff, please send it to them so that they know what we're expecting from them. I know I'm going to give them a few suggestions and ideas, and um, I really appreciate an understanding of what people 
on the board, my fellow and sister board members and brother need and want. So uh, Ms. Caps, are you okay with tabling the motion? Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much. So this motion is not made at this time, it is tabled. And I wanna thank you, uh, Ms. Carey and Ms. Escobedo for your input, thank you. And of course, thank you to the board. Our next agenda item is number three, which is the annual report of teacher assignments and approval of resolution number 2021-22-13, the annual report of teacher assignments, which we do every year. And I believe I will turn that over to Dr. Becchio. I will introduce you to Ann Peek, Director of Human Resources, who's up on the screen to present. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Board of Education, Board President Ford and Superintendent Dr. Maldonado. What you find in front of you is an action item that is brought to the board each year. Part of the flexibility that the Commission on Teacher Credentialing provides us is for teachers that are fully credentialed in one subject area but may have additional semester units in another subject area, be authorized to teach both subjects. For instance, a teacher may have a science credential, but they also have 18 semester units in math. So what that does now is it authorizes them to teach both subject areas because of the education code. Other ed codes authorize certificated staff to coach one period a day if they're not a PE teacher and another authorizes teachers with multiple subject credentials to teach core periods. One of the requirements in order to execute on these local assignment options is that the Board of Education approve the annual report of teacher assignments, which is included in the attached documentation and approve resolution 2021-2213. Are there any questions? This is an action item, so I'd like to ask Ms. Munoz if we have any public comments on this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm tired. Uh, Mr. Hio, any public comments on this item? Thank you, President Ford. Uh, we have no public comment on this item. Uh, thank you. And board members, any questions or comments, please? Seeing none, I'd like to call for a motion to approve action item number three, the annual report of teacher assignments and approval of resolution number 2021-22-13, the annual <laughs> report of teacher assignments. I so move. Thank you, Ms. Munoz, and a second? I second. Ms. Alvarez, thanks. And uh, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Thank you, Ms. Caps, and that motion passes unanimously. Board members, we all now go on to number four, which is the board action on student discipline. To remind everyone, the Board of Education is required to take action on student disciplinary actions in open session, but the review of the student disciplinary case is completed in closed session, as we did tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. So may I have a motion to approve action item number four, the recommended action on student discipline, ed code 48918, case number 202122-04. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Sims-Moten. And a second, please. A second. Thanks, Ms. Munoz. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. Uh, for the minutes, I want to make sure that you know that I was absent during that discussion, so I recuse myself from that vote. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to the report and discussion agenda, and the First subject, number one, uh, num we're on to number two, the progress report on student-centered learning goals. 
And there's a whole list of names of folks who may be reporting to us on the academic and behavioral goals, so I'll turn it over to the various cabinet members. Hello again, board members, President Ford, and Dr. Maldonado. Tonight, good tonight, um, as an educational system, uh, we would like to just start by reminding us all that we exist because and for our students. I think our conversations tonight have absolutely highlighted that as our priority and as our most essential responsibility, ensuring their educational and emotional well-being. Tonight, our educational and, uh, and student services departments, in partnership, as always, will provide the first of four progress reports on our district's student-centered goals. Next slide. We continue to focus on students with the balanced triangulation between our students, our teachers, and the standards. Our work is steadfast on these six student goals, which you are familiar with by now, which prioritize academic increase in language, literacy, mathematics, A through G eligibility, while also decreasing our over-identification of Latinx students in special education along with equitable responses to student behaviors, engagement of families, and of course, a nurturing of student health and wellness. All this has, has propelled our multi-tiered system of supports efforts that you have heard so much of this year and really focusing in on our change in order to turn theory into action. Next slide, please. So as you know, we have been learners ourselves, um, not just at the district level, but all the way through down to the school site in partnership with SWIFT. And part of our learning has helped us with this theory of change and how we engage the whole system. So the theory of change can only happen through action. This action must be inclusive of achievement through a whole system engagement effort which starts with our students and families, they being the purpose of our work, of course. The school site is that place of transformation. And at the district level, we being what serves as the point of intervention. Next slide. Turning theory into action also means we will be providing you for this school year three progress reports, and one next fall, focused on student achievement on the areas that I have already shared with you and you can see up on our slide. This makes our work transparent and allows for a collaborative process where everyone can help determine which actions need to be taken to better serve our students by providing interventions such as tutoring, academic counseling, or mental health services, just to name a few. Next slide. As we continue to transition from and through pandemic learning, where from last November to today, we have gone from full remote, remote learning to hybrid learning to full in-person learning. And through it all, our students have remained at the center. Our most essential questions when focused on improving student academic achievement before, during, and yes, after this pandemic are, what do we want students to learn? How will we know if students learned it? And what will we do when students do not learn it? These are the questions guiding our actions, our planning, and our next steps. And these are the questions that frame the progress report that we are sharing with you tonight. Let's begin, next slide, by looking 
at language fluency subgroup data for our whole school district as a reminder of whom we serve. This data shows us that of all of our TK through 12th grade students in Santa Barbara Unified, 53% of our students are English only, a little over 2% of our students are initially fluent English proficient or IFEP, 15% of our students are emergent multilingual learners or our EMLs, with 642 being identified as long-term English learners, uh, meaning they have been a, an emergent multilingual or learning a, a language for six years or more, and our reclassified fluent English proficient students, our RFEP students, make up 29% of our student population. This data is TK through 12. That's important as we move forward. Next slide. With the previous slides, the previous data on, uh, on the slide you just saw in mind, this first update that I am sharing tonight is progress towards language achievement. Because after all, everything begins and ends with language. It is important for us first to fully understand the continuum through which language is learned and developed, with the end goal, of course, being reclassification. For our students who enter the school system learning English as an ad additional language, they are assessed with the English Language Proficiency Assessment for California Assessment, or the ALPAC which determines the student's English language proficiency. The results of that assessment will identify a student as initially fluent English proficient, IFIP, which is that first column all the way on the left. And for us in Santa Barbara, we have, we currently have 304 IFIP students in our district. Some students will perform as a level one through four on the LPAC, one being a novice learner with minimally developed English language in listening, speaking, reading, and writing, of which we have 422 students in our district. Level two are our intermediate English learners with somewhat developed English language skills, and 340 of our students are at that level. We also have, at level three, 713 students that are considered at being at an intermediate level of English language development. And at level four, or fluent English level, students have well-developed English language skills. And at that level, we have 385 of our students currently on at level four. Our, once our EMLs reach proficiency level in their English language development and meet the reclassification criteria requirements, students will be considered reclassified fluent proficient or RFIP. In Santa Barbara, we have a whopping 3,651 RFIP students who, will who we will continue to monitor and support to ensure their continued success and proficiency. Next slide. So what are we doing? Now that we know this data, here's what, now what? Our current progress and next steps and actions towards improving language development achievement for this progress report have been summarized here. In the area of improving language development, our priority for what we want students to learn has largely focused on grade level standards based expectations through quality science curriculum for designated ELD and asset based instructional program opportunities like our dual language instruction programs. We will know students learned it through consistent daily designated English language development program and proper language development monitoring. And when they have not learned it, we will provide primary language support and integrated ELD throughout the day to name just a few of our actions. 
Our next steps include more primary language resources and supports, and of course this means supporting our teachers and our administrators in their learning of that, differentiated assessments, and ongoing interventions and tutoring opportunities. Next up, here we are showing you our progress in English language arts, or ELA. And this is our data for our students that are meeting or exceeding standards on our STAR assessment. Now, I mentioned that in the last data slides we were looking at TK through 12. Here, and for the rest of the data slides, you will see we are focused on, as it says up on the top, data inclusive of students in grades 3 through 8 and 11. Just want to make sure we're really clear on that and what we're seeing. So last spring, the board approved the use of the STAR ELA and math assessment in place of the state's suspended CASP assessment as our summative student measurement for the 2020-2021 school year. We are expecting to resume the CASP administration of the assessment in the spring for the first time since spring 2019 in this next spring. This graph for ELA and the one, uh, I've already said that, we do collect and monitor data. We do collect and monitor data from pre-K through second grade and grades, of course, 9th, 10th, and 12th. We not just collect it, we monitor it and we make informa uh, informed decisions on it. But here, today, we wanted to stay aligned with what the state assessment data usually reports on. The black and gray bars on the graph represent the spring 2020-2021 end of year results. The light and dark blue bars represent this fall's 2021 assessment results. So what does this data tell us? Starting with all students in those grade levels, the black bar on the left tells us that 52% of our third through eighth and 11th grade students met or exceeded the ELA standards during the end of year in the spring. The all students turquoise bar to the right shows us that as of September 2021, the fall assessment, 49% of our third through eighth grade and 11th grade students are projected to meet or exceed ELA standards. The beginning and middle of the year STAR assessment res results serve as predictors to determine how our students may perform on the spring state assessment. This data does not take into account, however, our tier one, our tier two, and our tier three instruction and interventions that schools are doing now and will continue to do uh, based on the, their own data analysis and findings. Our theory of change focus with whole system engagement means that this data will be used at the school site to provide multi-tiered differentiated supports and at the district level interventions to support the school sites. The theory of change is meant to disrupt these predictive pathways when they are not on the desired trajectory. Next slide. This ELA data from end of last school year and fall 2021 drills in a little further to how our students by language subgroups are performing in these same grades on the STAR ELA assessment. As you can see, at the end of the last school year, the data that stands out on this slide is within the IFIP group, performing at 58% at the end of the school year last year and at 39% meeting or exceeding standards this fall. And the other data that stands out is the data for our EMLs very particularly in levels one and two. 
But from, from what we've already talked about tonight, we understand that performing, that their performance at the end of the school year and this fall at 12% and 10% is as expected. And although it can be alarming, it is in the space that they are supposed to be working on um, as per their language development level. Next slide, please. So what do we do with that data? That is our ELA data. What have we done? Our actions for our achievement and literacy for what we want students to learn, how they will how we will know if they learned it and what we will do if they have not, have largely focused on professional learning to introduce our language and literacy plan to administrators and teachers to really deepen their understanding. Communication and learning around our grade level expectations, family guides, and the corresponding assessments. Enhancement of elementary ELA or language arts through professional development and focusing instructional strategies for all students inclusive of systemic phonics, phonemic awareness, and word study. And strategic, strategically identifying, evaluating, and using data from approved platforms to really make sure we are implementing our MTSS and using that to inform all tiers of instruction and supports. Our next steps include establishing a district-wide language and literacy task force, which has already started and expanding it, uh, making sure that we are including data chats in our systemic, our whole system engagement, lesson designs, and ongoing interventions and tutoring opportunities, again, um, so that we are ensuring these multi-tiered supports for the students as they need it where they need it. I will now hand it off to my partner in this work, Ms. Carey, who will share with you our progress report and data for math and A through G. Good evening, board members. Uh, thank you, Ms. Escobilla, for framing that and paving the way for, for my two updates. Uh, similarly, for math, the data you're seeing demonstrates the number and rates of students meeting and exceeding standards in math for grades three through eight and 11. For the bars on the left, we see data describing end of year performance from spring 2021, which is when we first administered STAR math to all students due to the suspension of CASP. Um, that's different from ELA. For the bars on the right, you will see data describing student performance during September of this school year. You may notice some differences in the total student counts, both between spring and September, and even if you were to go back between the math totals and the ELA totals. And I want to tell you what those differences are attributable to. Number one, STAR math administration is new in the secondary grades. So we're still developing our robust assessment practices around STAR math. Number two, the way STAR math is administered in the secondary grades is through en students' enrollment in their math classes. And with our traditional high schools on the semester block schedule, it means only half the juniors are in, roughly half the juniors are in math right now. So that's what accounts for some of those differences in the, in the N numbers. 36% of students, of uh, all students met and exceeded standard in math in the spring. As of December, it's 35, so relatively flat. Uh, who are projected to meet or exceed standard in math. We acknowledge that specific student groups call for more focused attention and we uh, deem it unacceptable that fewer than 40% of our students are achieving proficiency in math. As Ms. Escobedo said, this is our September score and we are confident that with the teaching, learning, and intervention that will go on between September and our assessment in May when we plan for CASP assessment again, uh, that you will see through the course of progress reporting throughout the year um, increases and in improvement in these rates of math achievement. Next slide. Uh, here we see the STAR math data repeated for all students on the left and then disaggregated by language proficiency level for both spring and for September. 
I think this is an opportunity to continue to reinforce a difference that we expect to see between emergent multilingual learners and those once ELs, once EMLs who have been reclassified and uh, because they have achieved English proficiency that is sufficient to reclassify as fluent English proficient along with other, other uh, additional factors. There can sometimes be that misconception, so it's helpful to see it broken down, uh, not just by EML and reclassified, but by specific language proficiency levels. Next slide. As we report to you on what we have done to date and what we are doing next with respect to math, um, I want to remind folks that we've published our family guides to um, end of grade and end of course expectations for math learning, that we are using a newly adopted illustrative math curriculum in our elementary schools now uh, through grade six, so it's new in K-5. And our math one, our first year math course for high school, has gone deep into defining essential learning for math one, which of course is a foundational course at, at the start of high school. We continue to deepen teachers' um, efficacy with using illustrative math as the adopted curriculum, um, as well as uh, in secondary deepening analysis of student thinking through evidence of student, student work. When it comes to uh, measuring and assessing what students have learned, um, illustrative math has curriculum embedded assessments and we are piling through a secondary math assessment team. It's a, it's a group, a, a very uh, large group of secondary math teachers who are uh, anal piloting and analyzing assessments throughout the course of this year, year in order to uh, formalize uh, assessments uh, next year and beyond. And of course you're becoming familiar with STAR Math and we have also this year begun with interim assessment blocks which are uh, very tied to the CASP, uh, uh, the CASP items uh, and the CASP assessment approaches for math. So we have that other additional data source as well for secondary. Um, we want to continue expanding equitable assessment practices and move beyond those pilot assessments in secondary to, as I said, formalized and adopted assessments that are common. We have both specific instructional practices that we are honing in on. Uh, mathematical language routines such as three reads, that's across the whole system. Um, we have worked with re-engagement lessons uh, in secondary and this works well with our Fisher and Fry initiative on clarity and engagement, but also we have structural supports, um, systems for tutoring, uh, for accessing tier two resources in elementary and secondary, and in secondary we do have students enroll in math support who are performing in below grade level, which is an additional class. And you'll see those kinds of things uh, toggle to our next steps. Um, I want to add that we are going to move from uh, a build on the Math 1 work and do that with the foundational course at the junior high level, Math 7, and then move from there to Math 8 and Math 2 uh, and next year. And that our instructional support specialists continue to give um, both um, collective and individualized coaching to teachers. Next slide. Going to shift gears to A through G, and I first want to um, explain what you're seeing in this graph. So, as a reminder to all, A through G eligibility is what renders students eligible to apply for admission to the UC CSU uh, system. And here in Navy, you see the percent of students meeting requirements uh, from last year's student body. So, when you see um, 11th grade here on this graph, that's this year's seniors. I wanted to point that part out. You'll see the yellow's not meeting requirements. Gray, that is a narrow band, is on track to meet requirements, but there's likely something that went a little wrong there, like a, a failure to pass a class. So it wasn't necessarily a question of how we, the plan was, or the plan was in place, but it was a, a, a question of, of maybe not meeting that plan and need to remediate that plan. Um, so we're, we're happy to have this data through our new partnership uh, uh, agreement that you approved with uh, transcript evaluation services in partnership with UCSB. So that's what this graph is showing you and we have access to this information and now our counselors and administrators at sites have access to this information. Um, as we go through here uh, and tell you some things that we've been able to do since we last reported to you on A through G in July. Um, we continue to have academic counseling conversations about students' post-secondary goals and even make pivots and adjustments in real time and midstream during the course of the academic year. Sometimes that involves enrolling students in credit recovery or credit repair opportunities. Um, and I want to introduce, for those, for those who may not know about it, I want to tell you about Assembly Bill 167. So uh, first I need to remind everyone 
that a D grade, while we consider that passing and it confers credit for a course, it disqualifies a student from A through G eligibility. You may recall that last year the UC CSU system accepted passing grades, grades of pass, no pass, um, and, and considered students eligible for admissions if, with a passing grade. So enter AB 167 where the state legislature said, well, we want that to be something that families can continue to request out of the experience of the pandemic, out of the experience of school year 2021. So school systems, families are able to ask you to convert their D grades into grades of pass. Well, in Santa Barbara Unified, we didn't just wait for families to ask us. We ran a report of all students who had earned a D in 2021. We began by prioritizing our seniors, and we have done our outreach to families and invited them to partner with us and agree to convert those grades from Ds to passing grades. So, so far, that's been something we've been able to do for 572 students, again, with a priority attention on seniors and then juniors and then sophomores. So we're going to see those bars shift. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, I want to remind you here of the slide that Ms. Escobedo spoke to, which was the whole system engagement slide, because I just mentioned something about state, the state and a shift in state policy that's really been favorable to our students in terms of A through G eligibility. But you're going to see multiple examples here of ways that we're serving students and families at the individual level, of schools being places of transformation, and of the district being a point of intervention in a systemic way. The graphics and the icons you see here are the ones we used in our summer report, and we're going to keep coming back to them so people understand how intentional we're being in our outreach to enhance and expand access to A through G eligibility. So first, MTSS. Um, we have now tracking systems for identifying students, as you've, as you've seen an example of on the prior slide, and providing them additional support through our academic counselors, but also through our newly hired college and career um, counselor, counselors and the interventions that they provide. So this, again, count, uh, counseling about schedules, about needing to remediate course credit, about post-secondary plans, and specific support for um, understanding, navigating, applying to, and successfully transitioning to post-secondary education. Um, next, uh, next box. Thank you, Brian. Um, I am so happy to celebrate. <laughs> that we continue to ensure that all courses that we offer are A through G uh, qualifying and that we received, we recently received A through G approval for um, the English courses that our emergent multilingual students are enrolled in for their English language development. So that's a real success. Um, we are interested in continuing to expand access to languages other than English, but I also want to highlight our expanding DLI, dual language immersion programs, both elementary and secondary. And we are working in conjunction with the, um, what's going to be the newly released math framework to look at our math sequence as well. Those are two, two barriers that we've seen historically in our data for students in terms of achieving A through G eligibility. Next. The, the transcript evaluation service. So this graphic uh, signals for us community partnerships. And the things you see represented here represent um, partnerships with UCSB, uh, partnerships with Santa Barbara County Education Office, partners in education, so career day speakers. Um, you've, I think you've heard about the junior high opportunities to, to explore uh, careers, uh, our virtual showcases coming up, and we continue to hold uh, multiple events for families and for students. We have MOUs with Santa Barbara Ed Foundation, um, and with other uh, CalSOAP and other uh, service providers uh, in our community for tutoring and other supports for, for success academically and for transitioning successfully to, uh, after high school. Um, and this last graphic here refers to the gears, our building capacity. So at the end of the day, A through G eligibility is about having access to the right courses and then passing those courses. And passing those courses has to do with how your learning is assessed. So these things here speak to ways that we are building our understanding as staff and educators uh, about equitable assessment. You're familiar with the grading for equity work that we've launched. Um, I want to make sure that you are, remember how deeply we, I highlighted in the math slides about our, our work with math assessment. Um, and we continue to build up the capacity, uh, both our workforce in the counseling realm and the capacity of our, of our counselors. 
And of course, we have, as been, has been referenced earlier tonight, our, our standards-based report cards in elementary. So I will now turn it over to Dr. Wagonick. Next slide, please. So moving on, we want to uh, give the board an update about um, the significant disproportionality work that we have been doing and illustrate that by, by way of the data. This first um, data graphic illustrates the fact that our two largest subgroups um, Latinx and white students um, have this significant disproportionality in the area of qualification for special education under the um, eligibility of specific learning disability. This is um, a result, as you know, of the over-identification uh, over of Latinx students um, for special education in this area. Next slide, please. So um, we've entered um, our second year of addressing this um, significant disproportionality and again have asked, um, what do we do when students don't learn? And the answer is that we must first revamp our system um, of reviewing student progress by creating a new system uh, for our student study teams. Um, also, we uh, have begun the work of building our multi-tiered system of support um, interventions uh, so that we can support students prior to a special education referral, so that we can make sure that we are providing um, um, the universal instruction that each student needs at the tier one level providing tier two supports as needed and appropriate um, before jumping to this special education referral. And that's especially important for, um, for our uh, EML students. And then finally, and this is a really, um, it says here professional development, but it's really more, it's, it's professional development so that our educators can distinguish between language differences and disabilities. And th that has been such a fundamental concept and it really is more than professional development. It's professional development that leads to um, an entire mindset change. It, it has been huge. Next slide. So though we're far from reaching our goal of parity between um, Latino and white students, this graphic shows that the work we began engaging in last year and continue this year is beginning to shut down the pipeline of Lat Latino students um, who are identified um, as needing special education services because of specific learning disabilities. Um, that is something to celebrate. And if we'll go to the next slide, um, even more encouraging data, and that is that we're seeing um, data in regards to the qualification of emergent multilingual students for special education services, we're seeing that um, those qualifications are dis, uh, declining dramatically. So how are we seeing, um, how are we doing things differently to s see this improvement? As I shared previously, schools are creating systems and they're changing their practices in a major way. They're revamping that SST process. Um, having meetings in advance of the student study team um, it, to really look at what individual students need. They're building up their general education interventions throughout the multi-tiered system of support. And then again, 
providing that professional development so that um, to distinguish between when a student um, needs targeted support because of a language difference or because of a disability and really understanding that. I want to take this opportunity because I think this is a powerful uh, slide to uh, illustrate the, um, the growth in this area. And I want to take the opportunity to call out a specific group not that they're the only ones doing the work, but they were at the tip of the spear, and that's our school psychologists. They really began doing this work several years ago, and they're a small group. <laughs> there are less than um, 50 school psychologists in our district, but they really have been leaders, and coincidentally, last week was School Psychologist Week nationally, and so um, I, I think it's important that we, we call that out because they have helped um, administrators, teachers, other educators really understand this concept of the difference between language difference and disability, and, and especially our bilingual um, school psychologists. Next slide. So moving on from significant disproportionality, uh, I want to uh, talk about um, two of our behavioral um, metrics. And the first is chronic absenteeism. Chronic absenteeism is um, defined as a, a chronic absentee is any student who has missed 10% or more of the days enrolled in a school year. But the great thing about this data point is that a student who may be chronically absent now may not necessarily be a chronic absentee all year long. And so for me, even when there is um, data that is not fun to look at, um, we can remain hopeful. So um, you see the data here, the blue is 2018-19, the, the red is 1920, and then we skip a year. And we skip last year because um, attendance was measured differently during distance learning. And so 2020-21 uh, will always be an asterisk year in terms of um, a number of metrics, but uh, definitely um, chronic absenteeism. So the gold bars are this year. We knew that the data would, um, we would have increased rates of chronic absenteeism uh, during this year because our goal is to keep kids in school and in order to keep kids in school sometimes kids need to be out of school and um, we were able to run data to see that over over one in f more than one in five of our students have been excluded from school for COVID related health reasons for at least one day and this is through October um, but I do want to say that's at least one day. However, we know that when students are excluded from school for COVID, it's usually more than one day or two days or five days. It's usually at least eight days and sometimes as many as 12 days. And so um, I remain hopeful that as we move on and continue to report to you throughout the year, um, that we are going to see better metrics moving forward. So what are we doing to address these escalated rates? First, we fortified our short-term independent study option so that students who are required to be at home because of COVID-related health issues can complete their work as they are able and they can be counted as present if they complete their assignments even if they're at home. So that option was put in place uh, and fortified in October. Second, we're utilizing the CLASS program. That's our system for supporting students and families who are identified as chronic absentees. This program includes uh, family meetings with school administrators and other support staff. It also includes home visits and referrals to in-school programs and outside agencies. We are also, um, through our youth outreach workers and our school social worker for homeless and foster students, providing targeted outreach to our highest priority absentees. This work allows us to focus on identifying the root causes of absenteeism, 
so that really the most important or appropriate supports can be provided to students in an individual way. Our school family advocates um, and family liaisons also work with these students and families to support them. And I, I, I talk about families in terms of absenteeism because absenteeism of this magnitude is more often than not a family issue, not just a, a student issue. And then finally, um, you will see that our students with disabilities have the highest absentee uh, rates. That is true year over year, and that is a national trend, not one that um, I am happy with, but, but it is the fact. Um, so we do have to focus other supports with our students with disabilities, and we often hold IEPs for students who are extremely chronically absent. Just review IEPs to, to make sure that we're providing the proper support. Um, moving on to the next slide. So as the board is aware, in August we implemented, implemented the new guidelines for how schools respond to student behavior. This data is very encouraging. And again, we, we have an asterisk year for last year. Um, but looking at um, three years of data, overall our suspension rates have dropped by nearly 400% since the 2019-2020 school year. At this point of the school year in 2019, 227 individual students have been suspended at least once. This year that number is 51. How have we done this? Uh, very simply, and for the most part, we are not suspending students unless their presence on campus poses a danger to themselves or others. Instead of students, instead our students are being referred to programs such as alternatives to violence, tobacco and vaping secession programs, drug and alcohol diversion, uh, school-based or community-based therapeutic counseling, education modules that address their behavior, et cetera. We address the root cause of the behavior because rather than utilizing exclusionary practices that research, reams of research show do not um, stop recidivism in this area, we are focusing on um, addressing the problem. Um, that does not have magically an overnight, but uh, we feel very um, confident about that. Next slide. So um, I'm going to bring us home with this, and that is tonight we've begun to tell the story of the progress being made towards achieving our student-centered goals that Ms. Uh, Escobedo reviewed at the outset of this report. In closing, I'm going to underscore that in order to make progress, we believe that we must employ an equity-based multi-tiered system of support that features first, and this is our what, strong administrative leadership that supports all educators um, through constant engagement. Second, fully integrated schools that exhibit strong and positive school cultures. Next, we must have relationships with families and communities that are based on trust. And finally, a strong relationship between the district office and schools that is supported by equitable and inclusive policies and structures. So how do we do that? The district and individual schools must continue the design of a vision for the future for our students that provides equitable and inclusive access to educational opportunities. And with a focus on that vision, we utilize teamwork. That's how we do it. And we focus our resources on the priorities that will allow us to realize that future vision. We must not get distracted. And we keep our eye on that vision. And it's a vision in which every student has every chance every day 
to graduate college and career ready. Where do we do this? We do this in teams, as I mentioned before. We team up. Uh, school, school sites are led by their district MTSS teams. Um, and then our district team, our job is to support and encourage and provide resources to schools when they need it and in the way that they need it. That is our responsibility as a district team. So where do we do the work? We do it in our teams. Only by multiplying the what, by the how, by the where, do we get to the why. And the why really is, it's, the why is so much, but it's also so simple. It's those student goals that Ms. Escobedo reviewed at the beginning. It's preparing students for a world that's yet to be created. It's making sure that there's equitable access. It's, it, uh, the why is, is the essence and the heart of what we do. And we have to stay focused on the what, the how, and the where, and not get distracted by other things. And so with that, um, I will close the presentation and open it up to your comments and questions. Uh, Ms. Carey, Ms. Escobedo, and, um, and I are available to answer those. Thank you so much to all three of you. I wonder if, uh, Ms. Trujillo, we have any public comment on this item? No public comment on this item, President Boyd. Thanks so much. Then I guess I would like to turn it over to board members for questions and comments. Please signify by raising your hand if you have something you'd like to say. Ms. sims Moton, please. Yes, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for this report, uh, very detailed. Um, and I, it, it helps me connect the, the, the uh, interventions that you're talking about all year long that to the point where you both, all three of you actually have said that you have confidence, although the numbers are not what we want to see right now for the spring, but because of things that we're putting in place, we have confidence that, that that's going to improve. So I, I appreciate that. And then the other thing I had a question um, on the AB 167, is that ongoing or is that, okay, so it has a, sorry. So AB 167 specifies uh, school year 2020, 2021, but it is for students in all grade levels in that school year. So okay. that's students 9 through 12 were impacted by that well students beyond 9 through 12 were impacted by the pandemic and that's why I was talking about prioritizing our seniors who are the closest to college uh, application and admissions and then continuing to work through the juniors sophomores and freshmen from school year 2021 and do we use that as after they haven't had or they passed the the opportunity to improve the grade on their own I mean you know if they've done everything they still the most they can get is a D then we go to the AB 167 opportunity or right these are right. these are grades that are already okay. logged yeah that are kind of in the rear view mirror but yeah so, so I hear your question being about recovering the learning mm -hmm. um, so I think the priority now is to most of these cases when we look at the data it's not a student with a single D oh. it's a student that has more than one D and maybe you know so that's that's what's happening now is we're trying to redress those those grades and continue to support them in learning in whatever ways they most need it and then lastly, I'll just say I just really appreciate this whole uh, report about what we are doing differently um, to, again, it's student-centered and the how, the why, and what, I mean, the, what I wrote it down, actually, your how times the why and, and what, that sort of thing. What, how, and get where, to that. yeah. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> so I got all of that. So, no, I just really appreciate that. And, and really, so what this helps me do um, is to connect everything that we've talked about this whole year. It comes here and says, where are those things connecting? Because absent that connection, that sometimes is like, well, well what, is that, what is that doing? How is that helping? So t tonight's report really helped me connect all the things that you've talked about all year long of the interventions and the services that you're providing results in this, in the confidence that we're really putting those things in place to make sure that our students are successful and through the equity-based lens as well. So thank you very much for that. Ms. Alvarez, please. Thank you, Ms. Sims. -Mountain. Thank you. Great, great progress report. I, I was just really, really <laughs> focused listening to you, so thank you for that. Um, I do have a couple of questions on slide seven. 
the RFEP students, 3,651. How many of those students are at grade level? Um, my worry is that, yes, they are reclassified, which is great. It's a great achievement. And um, we have a seventh grader who might be uh, three or four grade levels behind. So I'd be interested in knowing how many of them, and you don't have to answer now because you might not have it, but I'd be interested in knowing how many of those students are at grade level. And if they're not, what supports are in place for us to help them? Do we have targeted tutoring, for example? Uh, what do we have? Thank you for that question, uh, Board Member Alvarez. I actually do have the, the answer. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny because that number jumped out at me also, so much so that I had to confirm with uh, Mr. Rouse. Uh, and we double checked the number. Mm -hmm. um, and we are, to answer your question, for fall, what we're talking just fall, our fall yeah. ELA assessment, and I'm talking about ELA right here, right now. Um, we are at 40, about 41% of our RFIP students meeting or exceeding grade level standards on the START assessment. For math, our RFIPs, a little different story. Thank you. Uh, we have, a, looks like 25%. For the fall assessment in math, about 25% uh, of our students, third through eighth grade and 11th grade, remember those are the grade levels we're focused on here, are meeting and exceeding grade level standards on the STAR math assessment. And what are we doing? Yes, ex exactly what you just said, which was incorporated into not just the what do we want them to learn? How do we know if they learned it? And what do we do for the students about it? By design, MTSS means that as a system, we are looking at this data, not just us, to really be able to drill down in time appropriate ways and differentiated uh, ways to the students as we see this data um, you know, as we see this data results in our school sites. And so whether they are meeting it and they're doing great, what are we doing for those students? And or if they're not meeting it, what do we do for those students? And so it starts with the tier one, the in-class good quality instruction, the teacher knowing this data, then providing that differentiated extra support as needed um, depending on how they're performing. Thank you. And then another question. Uh, you mentioned that there's a district-wide literacy task force. Could you help me understand the composition of that task force and how are members chosen to be in that task force? Yes, actually. Um, so th this is a, the superintendent's uh, literacy task force. Um, and that started, we have, uh, it has evolved. We have had different stake stakeholders, all stakeholders. We have teachers, classified. We have parents. We have partner, community partners, uh, uh, administrators. We have a little, a little bit of everything that at the beginning was um, maybe, you know, we, we, they had volunteered. They, they showed interest in being part of this when we started talking about language and literacy. And every time we have met, we have actually also asked for them to volunteer or share names, nominate, re, uh, do some outreach, and to bring them, invite them into the task force. Of, of, and so it's an ever-growing, ever-evolving, multi-stakeholder uh, group. Do you know how many teachers are part of that group? I don't have the breakdown of that because, like I said, it has it, it has evolved. We're inviting more people um, as as we go, so I, we can get that information for you. I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. I have a. a I can oh, answer sorry. that question. I think we have representatives from every school. They don't always make it, but we've only set up a few meetings for the school year, so it's not like a regular every day kind of or every week. I believe we set up four or five meetings for the whole school year. Thank you. I have other questions, but I will email them to you in sure. interest of time. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. Other questions? Ms. Munoz, no. Mr. Kelly, no. 
and Miss Caps. Did she say no? Okay, I have a couple questions. Um, uh, Ms. Escobedo, can you tell me a little bit more? Uh, I'm very interested in early literacy, and I'm wondering uh, when you say the next step is systematic phonics, what or sensory systematic phonics, what does that mean, and what does it look like? Great question. Um, as you know, uh, President Ford, um, we have continuously looked into improving and evolving our um, language and literacy program. We knew the data did tell us, and research and science told us that we needed to be more inclusive of phonics. Phonics and phonemic awareness. We have looked into different programs, different approaches, different um, methods that um, have shown proven success in, in different districts that have similar student populations. And uh, some of those programs um, do include some TPR, some phys total physical response. Some of those are manipulative manipulatives um, with the phonics um, programs. Uh, we have the Hegarty and the Words Their Way that are also examples of multiple uh, forms of phonemic um, instruction that has been included into our uh, English language block. Would you, though, agree that we're not still not making it? Um, I would say that we are very early in our learning of that incorporation into our program, um, and I am very hopeful that with time, just like with everything, um, our teachers will um, continue to build their capacity and feel more comfortable and we will see the results along with, along with this focus on language development that we know also plays a big part in making sure that they are successful in ELA. Thank you. Um, Ms. Carey, uh, Grading for Equity, can you just give the board a brief uh, synopsis of how it's rolling out? Uh, yes, we uh, invited teachers to participate. We could accommodate up to about 40, and we had close to that number indicating interest. We ended up with a cohort of around 30. Um, with representatives from every school site, there were multiple representatives from some school sites. Um, as we presented in, in March and talked about that contract in June, the nature of that professional learning is through action research. And so after introductory learning, um, teachers actually select one or more practices to adopt, and then they go through cycles. Um, cycle two, just we just wrapped up with cycle two. Part of a cycle involves coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching with consultants from a Crescendo Ed group. And the, I'm calling them the students because really the teachers are kind of the students in this case. Uh, they, they get to share out uh, with their peers and with their coach how the adoption of that particular practice or practices is having an impact in their, in their classroom, uh, in their grade books, and in their mindset. You know? So that's what's been happening. We're in cycle two. Um, our next cycle will be in the winter, and we'll be having a, a, a parent, a family, caregiver uh, outreach uh, event, too, to help explain to families uh, the work because I know there's some questions about what does this mean in terms of the value of the ultimate grade and what does it signify or communicate. Um, we have had some participants um, opt out just for wor workload considerations. So um, it's a small but mighty cohort that continues on with, with high fidelity to the action research model. And do any of the members of the cohort have the freedom to eliminate Ds? Yes. So they can do some action research on how that impacts uh, teaching and learning. Yes. I don't know that any have selected that. But it um, is an option. Right. Great. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Dr. Wagonick, I have a question for you. Um, more, it's more comment, uh, and that is, number one, I am delighted to see suspension rates dropping. It's been a major concern of our board, and as you know, we're breaking the school-to-prison pipeline. However, I must tell you that if you aren't aware, the board has been made aware by numerous teachers of grave concerns about student behavior and response. 
And so suspension rates dropping are only part of the success story as long as teachers feel supported and students are being successful in class. So I don't know if you want to comment on that or just understand my concern uh, that we are hearing from teachers saying they are very, uh, they're worried about the behavior they're seeing. I am equally, I'm, I'm in total agreement that I have never seen in, in my career um, behavior um, at the level that it is at now. I think it's an and both approach. It is not our policy and protocols that is causing this behavior. I think it is very easy to jump to that conclusion because people are looking for answers. Um, and so what we have to do is we have to listen to the teachers and we have to understand what is going on and, and take action to address the root causes of what's going on with the students. We are in an endemic now, right? We're coming out of this pandemic. And this is what trauma does. And, and there's no easy solution. There is no magic wand. Um, the staff, the student services staff is very concerned about educators' capacity to, to hold all of this. Right. And I think what we saw last week was a, di a, a, a manifestation yes. in a big way. And so I share your concerns. I think we do and both, and we just listen and work through and try to do the best that we can. And my job is to make sure that I support the principals and other administrators at schools so that they can support the teachers as we work through this and try to help. Um, I mean, students have to relearn behaviors. And learning, it takes a long time to learn to read and do math. There's no magic wand for behavior. Behavior has to be learned over time or retaught, and that's that's another struggle that we are facing. So, well, I I totally agree, and I appreciate your uh, compassionate view of it. I would love to ask you that at some point you could share with us also um, some of the strategies that are being used at the schools where we're seeing some success. I know that. Um, we all find different words to describe it, but a couple teachers told me yesterday that they feel like the students need help understanding how to be students again mm -hmm. after this past year. And mm -hmm. so perhaps we can uh, either have a task force or have teachers get together and just kind of say, what are some behaviors that we need to either reteach, re incentivize, uh, reinforce, etc." So thanks for considering doing that. Absolutely. For the board, we can we can bring a report of of what's of what's going on, and I would say even before learning how to be students again, we have to ask the teachers to look and say, is this is being a student is a student able to be a student today, or do they have other needs that precede being a student? And so that's what we're really faced with. You're right, many layers of mm -hmm. complication. No, I'm happy, happy Thank you. to bring that. Great. Any other comments or questions, board members? Thank you so much. Seeing none, thank you to the team who reported to us. It was comprehensive. Something, some of the data was alarming, some of it was reassuring, and some was very, very hopeful, so thank you. Um, I will now turn to item number three, the report on the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant. And that would be Mr. Venz, please. All right. Good evening again. Uh, so I bring good news. We received money. So as part of Assembly Bill 130, uh, they included the Educator Effectiveness Grant. So we just got our allocation recently. Uh, so one thing, uh, so what's really fantastic is it's $3.5 million in terms of our allotment. The one thing about this 
this grant is it's a five year we have five years to be able to spend this money which is great and five years it includes this year so it's this calendar year and then the other years out so um so that would include anyway so we got five years that's two let's see 20 25 26. Uh, a couple of other things to remember this is based on calpads data for ftes so that's how they got the allotment there as well uh, and the guidance around this means that uh, basically we have to use the funding for uh, providing professional learning and coaching mentoring uh, sel and student engagement uh, professional learning uh, effective learning or effective language acquisition and early childhood education so we got 10 targets that we could focus on specifically so here's the deal with this um, first off the the template that you see this grant written on is not by CDE CDE did not provide a template so we had to create our own template uh, so that's what you see with this planning. The second thing that's really important for you to know as board, uh, we are required to show you the, give you report on the plan and at the next meeting where we will, or you will take a vote on the plan. So, and it has to, the vote has to be completed by the end of December. So it's a quick turnaround after the vote we do nothing with the plan other than we just hold on to it we don't send it to the county office or anything like that so it's different than other plans that we had um, one of the things that we're looking at so you know um, how we're approaching this is what's really important is we have to look at three specific things the one is like now we have this funding and the funding source, we've got to look at how much time we have with each funding source and start to readjust our plan process. So we're not going to dive in immediately and start using this money. We need to first go to, for example, we need to use Title II and this year's Title II. We need to zero out all of our annual funds. So Title II, Title I, Title III. Then we could start looking at our monies like our ESSER, uh, make sure we spend all of our ESSER 1 money, which is needs to be spent by, I think it's September or August. We still have some funding left there. We've got to look at that. Then we start looking at ESSER 2 because that's a two-year funding source. ESSER 3 is a three-year funding source along with the E. I'm using all of these acronyms. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Anyway, so we have the ELO and IPI. We have all of these various funding sources <laughs> with different timelines. So we might need to take a look at, we just passed the ESSER 3 uh, plan, but we might need to take a look at that and say, you know, instead of spending $300,000 towards professional learning from that plan, let's put it into this plan for two years down the line and use that money instead for like FTEs or something like that like thinking in a way that's very strategic with all of our funding. Um, one other thing regarding this, the, the second thing is just, again, we have to look at the most restricted funding sources to the least restricted in terms of making our funding choices. The last one is that we, again, we want to engage those in the school district around the decisions with this process. What you see here, what I've given you specifically is uh, information that we received from our teachers who are providing professional learning who are seeing where the trajectory where we will be needing to head but ultimately once we go through we just went through this report uh, about our data but we're gonna have to use that cycle of inquiry to make decisions around this so it's going to be a longer process and again it's five years of funding source which is fantastic so that's all I have for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very nice to be ending the meeting on a very high note. I appreciate that. Mr. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this item? No public comment on this item. Thank you. That, that leads us to boards. Board members, any comments or questions on this item? 
Ms. Alvarez, please. Thank you for such a good report. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on the teacher input to develop this plan? Are we giving them the professional development that they say they need? Uh, so would you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I, I think that, um, I think there was a really good point in terms of bringing up how much professional learning we're provided, providing the teachers. So I think we have to be very sensitive to like at this moment, where, what will we be providing them right now, considering the weight that what they're carrying in the schools and what they're learning and, and so on. Um, regarding the, the input, this I could see in terms of as we looking towards the future, in terms of bringing in the schools and bringing in, um, because we do have to take input in terms of like LCAP and using various, we have the superintendent's task force, and we have these different groups and that's how I would recommend actually as we start to move into the next year to really figure out how to use this funding source to leverage what we want to get. Thank you. And another thing, I, I know you're already doing this. <laughs> I know you are. To look at all the different funding sources and see how we can free up some of our general money, general fund monies, oh, yeah. so that we can build our reserve or that we can use it towards other purposes. So later on, maybe you and Ms. Hernandez can bring up an update on that. Thank you. Yes. That, I have no more questions. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much. Ms. Sims Moten, please. Yes. First of all, thank you. <laughs> Good to hear, as, as President Ford said. So I had a question. As you know, as Universal TK, Pre K is coming in. So mm -hmm. how will or can this be used to um, to meet those needs at all? I don't know if they're more facilitated needs that are coming with regards to Universal you know, uh, kindergarten that's coming, like in three, four, three and four year olds, how are we able to, to work through that process um, in terms of meeting that need, either be it facility wise or teacher wise or whatever? So um, again, this would have to be focused specific because this is cat it's more like a categorical funding. So it would really have to be okay. for professional learning. The good news is it's professional learning, not just for teachers. It could be classified staff and so on. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would have to say is that with this new, we're not sure what we're going to see in terms of the money that will be you that will be provided to to launch this effort, right? So if we get the, that funding this year, or at the end of this year, whenever we receive it, mm -hmm. we could take a look at that, figure out how we're going to use that funding, and knowing that we have this, you know, in place. So if we start a project or we start an initiative with a real clear plan and we need to continue to use, we need to provide more professional learning, right? We have turnaround with staff and so on. We can dip into this and start using it that way. And we, again, we have five years in the process, so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions from board members? Seeing none, I thank you again for this report and the good news and look forward to more information about the next steps. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, board members, there are no consent items to return to tonight, so we'll just moved on, uh, move on to coming events, future agenda items. Take a look at them. If there's anything that you'd like to add or note, uh, please get back to us about that. I will mention, of course, that next week is our Thanksgiving break, a much-deserved break for all of the employees and the students, and also that November is National Native American Heritage Month. Very appropriate. I'd also like to ask Dr. Maldonado and um, Ms. Trujillo to be sure to add the approval of the Board Governance Handbook on future agenda items and for December. And our next regularly scheduled meeting is one meeting in December, Tuesday, December 14th at 5.30, and the public participation will be virtual. Uh, this is the only board meeting scheduled for December. And as we adjourn tonight, I, oh, sorry, Ms. So, Sims Moten, please. Yeah, I just want to get clarification with regards to, um, oh gosh, uh, the district trustees area so that we can add the maps so, so the public's able to draw their own maps. Did you need any further direction from us on getting that done or? Um, I don't think so. I, I mean, I think we're going to try to find uh, first a way to 
follow through on two things. One is more input on the map drawing and also on the hybrid model that Ms. Caps brought up. I think we need both of those uh, and more engagement and um, hopefully Thursday we'll be able to provide that. Yeah, so I was just wondering, because it was a separate package, so do we need to have that separate package to, to address what you're just saying, Ms. Ford? Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, she would, I would just. I, I would say uh, that I felt like there was general approval to do that, and so yeah. if we determine that that's necessary, I believe Dr. Maldonado told me it's about a $5,000 item. Mm, okay. I, I mean. I just want to know, if, I didn't know if you need further direction. If that's, you don't need that other than the, the direction we gave I you, just, you I, can have that. I think the only question is it, it, we're happy to add it on. It will be an extra cost of about five to eight thousand dollars. Oh, five to eight. Tonight. Okay. So um, if the board wishes to, just let me know and I can go ahead and add that. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I, was, I just want to get clarification because I brought it up, but that's me, one person. I just want to get clarification if that's the will of the board, the whole board. Board members, are there any concerns with adding that on as an, uh, as an additional feature of our uh, review of trustee maps? I see no concerns. Oh, sorry, Rose. Yes, no, no, I was thinking that my, certainly has my support. Great, thank you. Thank you. I see nodding heads, thumbs up. Sounds good. Thank you for bringing that back up, Ms. Sims Moten. Our next scheduled meeting, as I was saying, is on Tuesday, December 14th at 5.30. It will be participation virtually for the public. And as we adjourn tonight, I want to focus on gratitude at a time when we're planning for Thanksgiving, but in a bigger, much bigger way. And tonight I'd like to share a quote from the humanitarian and medical missionary, Albert Schweitzer, who said, at times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. So we go forth together and we lean on each other. And with that, to the teachers and staff, we see you, want you to rest and recharge next week. We are thank you, thankful for you. Happy Thanksgiving and happy Hanukkah. And with that, tonight's meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School Board is adjourned at 10.25 p.m. Good evening. <laughs>